Just don't know. Oh, I get warm as I pass by. You look at me, baby, like my shoes on tight, and it's starting to drive me crazy. I'm pouring up, I got my shoes on tight, and I'm thinking about you every single night. It's not enough for me to just stay by, just thinking about you, baby. I'm pouring in, I got my shoes on. Hold the answer to your question Why? Tell me you left me and I won't lie Just thinking about you, baby Walking around with your shoes untied He keeps walking around with your shoes untied Keep walking around with your shoes untied I cut you walking around with your shoes untied Just thinking about Question why? Tell me you left me and I won't lie. Just thinking about you, baby. I'm pouring out, I got my shoes on tight, and I'm thinking about you every single night. It's not enough for me to just stay by. Just thinking about you, baby. I'm pouring it, I got my shoes on tight, and I hold the answer to your question why. Tell me you left me and I won't. Shoes on tight And I lost track of the one real while When I think about it, it makes me think I'm right Wonder about it and I don't know why Won't you tell me, baby I'm pouring up, I got my shoes on tight And I'm thinking about you every single night It's not enough for me to just stay back Question why? Tell me you left me and I won't lie. Just thinking about you, baby. Sophisticated from my head to toe. Tell me something that you just don't know. Oh, I get warm as I pass by. You look at me, baby, like my shoes on tight, and it's starting to drive me crazy. I'm pouring up, I got my shoes on tight, and I'm thinking about you every single night. It's not enough for me to just stay by, just thinking about you, baby. I'm pouring in, I got my shoes on tight, and I hold the answer to your question why. Tell me you left me, and I won't lie, just thinking about. Untied. He keeps walking around with his shoes untied. Keep walking around with his shoes untied. I cut you walking around with his shoes untied. Just thinking about you, baby. I'm pouring up, I got my shoes untied. And I'm thinking about you every single night. It's not enough for me to just stay by. Just thinking about you, baby. I'm over in it. I got my shoes untied. And I hold the answer to your question why. Tell me you left me and I won't lie. Just thinking about you, baby. I'm over in it. I got my shoes untied. And I'm thinking about you every single night. It's not enough for me to just.
Think I'm glad Wonder about it and I don't know why Won't you tell me, baby I'm pouring up, I got my shoes on tight And I'm thinking about you every single night It's not enough for me to just stay back Just thinking about you, baby I'm pouring it, I got my shoes on tight And I hold the answer to your question, why? Tell me you left me and I won't lie Just thinking about you, baby Sophisticated from my head to toe Tell me something that you just don't know Oh, I get warm as I pass by You look at me, baby, like my shoes on tight And it's starting to drive me crazy Shoes on tight, and I'm thinking about you every single night. It's not enough for me to just stay back, just thinking about you, baby. I'm pouring it, I got my shoes on tight, and I hold the answer to your question. Why? Tell me you left me, and I won't lie. Just thinking about you, baby. Walking around with your shoes on tight. Keeps walking around with his shoes untied. Keep walking around with his shoes untied. I cut you walking around with his shoes untied. Just thinking about you, baby. I'm pouring up, I got my shoes untied. And I'm thinking about you every single night. It's not enough for me to just stand back. Just thinking about you, baby. I'm pouring Shoes on tight, and I hold the answer to your question. Why? Tell me you left me, and I won't lie. Just thinking about you, baby. I'm pouring up, I got my shoes on tight, and I'm thinking about you every single night. It's not enough for me to just stay back. Just thinking about you, baby. I'm pouring it, I got my shoes on tight, and I hold the answer to your question. Why? Tell me you left me, and I won't. My shoes on tight And I lost track of the wondering why When I think about it, it makes me think I'm glad Wonder about it and I don't know why Won't you tell me, baby I'm pouring up, I got my shoes on tight And I'm thinking about you every single night It's not enough for me to just stay Question why? Tell me you left me and I won't lie. Just thinking about you, baby. Sophisticated from my head to toe. Tell me something that you just don't know. Oh, I 
get warm as I pass by You look at me big, feel like my shoes on tight And it's starting to drive me crazy Babe, are you home? Oh, okay, I got my sure. shoes on tight And I'm thinking about you every single night It's not enough for me to just stay back Just thinking about you, baby I'm over in it, I got my shoes on tight And I hold the answer to your question, why? Tell me you left me and I won't lie Just thinking about Think I'm glad Wonder about it and I don't know why Won't you tell me, baby I'm pouring up, I got my shoes on tight And I'm thinking about you every single night It's not enough for me to just stay back Just thinking about you, baby I'm pouring it, I got my shoes on tight And I hold the answer to your question, why? Tell me you left me and I won't lie Just thinking about you, baby Sophisticated from a head to toe Tell me something that you just don't know Oh, I get warm as I pass by You look at me, baby, like my shoes on tight And it's starting to drive me crazy Welcome to the Brady Snell's Podcast Book Club. We're live in Reykjavik, Iceland on a Tuesday night, Wednesday morning. It doesn't really matter where we are, does it? Thanks to social media, we're all connected. We're all in this together. And it's our collective responsibility to make the digital world that we want to see. 
The Brady Snells podcast was started in 2013 and has been the inside guide to all things Hollywood, film, culture, and literature for the past eight years. But in my opinion, it's in the last year that the podcast has really taken off in terms of both content and style. Before the Walter Kern episode, published September 6, 2020, Brett released the first installment of an unnamed serialized memoir, recalling the time that shaped his writing and himself. It was a time when serial killers stalked the darkened alleys of California. It's also a time when Brett found himself navigating the privileged and decadent world of private high school in Los Angeles. A new student arrives in Brett's senior year, and we know this arrival will set in motion a sequence of events that have haunted Brett his entire life. This new audio memoir is called The Shards, and let me be bold, it is the perfect blend of Brett Easton Ellis, the author, host, and social commentator. Each installment has you waiting for the next, and you spend the two weeks between each podcast episode debating what is this, what happened, is it real, did this really happen? Which brings us to the book club and this live stream. As patrons of the podcast, we decided to read each of Brett's books one by one and discuss them with special guests and all of you. Forgot my platinum card. Brett's third novel, American Psycho, is his most famous and controversial novel. It follows the exploits, real or imagined, of a young, insecure stockbroker named Patrick Bateman. He's obsessed with dinner, suits, movies, music, porn, drugs, and murder equally. He's hungry to feel something, anything, and he wants to fit in. Before it was published, some concerned employees of the publisher, Simon and Schuster, leaked some of the more violent passages to the press, which led to Simon & Schuster cancelling the publication. The novel eventually did get published on March 6, 1991, about 30 years ago today. But the controversy didn't stop there. Instead of seeing it as a clear indictment of materialism and greed, which it clearly was, some critics found the violence too unsettling and the treatment of women misogynistic. Little did the critics know that in 30 years, everyone would see his or her shopping, sex, and socializing flattened together on a little black screen. We're all Patrick Bateman now. We're even obsessed with Trump, for goodness sakes. Who could have called that? We have a wonderful live stream for you tonight. Just remember, if you want to join in the discussion, to comment on the YouTube live stream. Our guests tonight include the sociologist and comedian Mete Kucho. We have the authors Bjorn Helgeson and Helga Helgeson. We also have the author of Train Spotting, Irvin Welsh. Another interview includes the writer of the film adaption of American Psycho, Guinevere Turner. All of the selected readings are produced and read by Colton Martin. Abandon all hope, ye who enter here. And so begins Brett Easton Ellis' third novel, American Psycho, published 30 years ago on March 6th. And uh, we're here to discuss it today with the Brett Easton Ellis Podcast Book Club. My first guest is Helgumer Helgeson. He's uh, the author of the novel The Woman at a Thousand Degrees, which is available on Amazon. Nice little plug for you. And he's also the author of 101 Reykjavik, which is the first movie I saw when I mo moved to Iceland and the first book I bought in the bookstore. Oh, great. So, yeah. So uh, what, can you, what can you tell me about American Psycho? Well, it was a revelation uh, to me when I... When I uh, discovered this book, uh, I had been living in New York in the 80s, so I sort of knew the background of the book. And But I had uh, moved to Paris when I picked it up, uh, and, uh, and I was living there, you know, and um, uh, started writing also. But I came from the uh, field of visual arts, and, and for me, the American Psycho was coming from that field a little bit. Uh, uh, for me, it wasn't really... Uh, as you expected literature to be, so it was like a more conceptual book and uh, and very fresh, of course, and very daring and hardcore and and uh, mind blowing, you know, to read and and so it was a big influence on on one on one Reykjavik uh, I, that came out in ninety six. So I'm a little bit older than uh, Ellis, but uh, uh, he influenced me. All yeah, the same. he wrote it at quite a, a young age, and like and like you said, it is a very graphic book. And reading it back then, I can imagine why people had the reaction that they did, to have something so visual as a book right away. But now reading it, because I, I just read it before the live, live stream here, there's something, there's something kind, of like, uh, like kind of like current about it. It feels like that's how we live right now all the time, that all this sort of visual stimulation is happening constantly. 
Yeah, it seems like uh, strong uh, works of literature are always sort of uh, po- they sort of uh, they are prophetic in in a way that they they tell you what what is coming, you know. And, and but for me, w- at the time when I read it the first time, uh, it was very contemporary, and that that's what I liked about it so much, you know. I like this uh, thing, y- y- you know. It didn't describe characters or uh, by the looks or character, but uh, but only from uh, the point of view of the, the the clothing, you know, designer items and everything. That was kind of fresh, and and it, w- it was a rule that he kept throughout the book, and and also I was blown away by the musical reviews that I <laughs> thought they were kind of funny and 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 crazy, and he was writing. Literature about you know <laughs> Phil Collins or yeah yeah or yeah Whitney Houston and Huey Lewis and the news and it, it was so uh, daring and fresh and uh, and uh, uh, I, uh, for me I didn't know if it was sincerely meant or sarcastically meant or if the author liked this kind of music or if the if if he didn't or if uh, the main character liked this kind of music and, and but those are the Maybe the only chapters in the book where he is really, uh, you know, it's sensitive and in, in emotional. Yeah, they're very, like, w- as soon as it goes to the reviews, like, of Genesis, or, you know, anytime he's talking about music, it, it does become more personal. Yeah. It seems like everything else is almost like a, a false self. He's always exaggerating or yeah. lying or deluded in some way. But then this is where you can kind of see this is a lonely person who's, who wants to connect yeah, yeah, in yeah. some way. And is there any any passages in the book that really s- uh, stick out for you to this day? I think the, 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 the those parts are are really great, you know, uh, for me. And of course, the funny scenes at the restaurants and, uh, and you know uh, <laughs> the tunnel and uh, the U two concert and and uh, all this uh, portrait of uh, portraying of uh, Manhattan uh, at the time, you know, he really captures the the zeitgeist and uh, th- they're constantly this uh, reference to the Les Miserables, yeah. the musical that mm-hmm. was on on Broadway at the time but it com- becomes kind of almost like a, a, a second title of the book, you know, because they are all kind of Les Miserables of today, you know, yeah, even yeah. though they have a lot of money, so b- but they're sort of empty inside and, and I hadn't read the, the, the Victor Hugo book uh, w- when I read this one the first time, but now I have read it. Uh, one of the best novels ever written, and and so it gives an extra sort of dimension to to this uh, portrait of uh, New York. Yeah, there's a, there's a, the line in the book. I it comes down to this. You know, I look great, but I feel like shit. Yeah, and that, that was a key line also <laughs> <laughs> that I took from this book uh, the first time I read it. And I carried it on uh, into my book, uh, 101 Reykjavik, that came out a little bit later. And I think this book uh, has m- had many offsprings, you know. And yeah, of yeah. course, uh, I think Train Spotting must be one of the distant relatives of this book. And yeah. my book, 101 Reykjavik, and uh, interesting, interestingly enough, uh, all those three books uh, inspired the movies yeah, yeah. by the same title and they came sort of out at the same time do, uh, around the year 2000 yeah that's right the, the movie actually uh, train spotting it's uh, was released 25 years ago tonight oh okay yeah so yeah so well <laughs> birthdays yeah it's a bunch of anniversaries yeah. all at the same time yeah and, uh, and all those movies are really good yeah I was surprised how, how good but wha- this book came uh, yeah, the m- we have yeah the movie is like a lot different though than yeah. than the book in this case because the movie seems to be there and you never get the kind of the same sort of character that you get pulled out of the book but that's I think that's normal yeah, yeah, and yeah. it also seems to be a completely kind of different story in a way yeah but it, but it's I- I in its own right it it's uh, sort of yeah works well as a movie and and you lived in in New York like you said and you were in Paris but coming from Iceland and then when you're going to make literature yourself how how did like how do you lo- kind of like bridge the gap from where you came from to interpreting this and having it influence you in your writing and how did people receive like your work when it came out here you know it was uh, of course i had to we have a different c- kind of culture. We don't have this tradition of serial killers in Iceland. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and it's the most peaceful country on earth. So, uh, <laughs> so the violence part was not really. Uh, I couldn't really translate that into Icelandic culture. Mm-hmm. But uh, the pornographic part, of course, I could take with me. And uh, I just wanted to 
write about contemporary stuff like he did in this book and, and describe I, uh, life in Iceland as it was. And yeah. in, in our literature, we hadn't seen that, you know. We people hardly drove cars in Icelandic novels uh, at, <laughs> that, at that time. You know, it was <laughs> it was more horses and, and sort of respected, you know, li literature in that way, traditional. So I wanted uh, it. It was like a pop uh, culture novel, and um, it was met with uh, bad reviews and <laughs> and sort of uh, it, it was like a not really good reception. Uh, only when the movie came out, yeah, the the book sort of. Yeah, and how, I mean, like I guess because, like you said, all of these books that we're talking about tonight, especially American Psycho, but then Train Spotting your book were transformed into movies. And how did that? Did they have the kind of the effect that I, I believe the movie had with this book as well? Is it always gives it a push? Like with Train Spotting and American Psycho, the movie seems to get people again interested back in the book. Yeah, and you and the movie on 101 Reykjavik was directed by uh, Baltazar Kormakar, whose son actually uh, directed the intro video. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. So come full circle. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, the book was in a coma for four years, and then the movie came and, and sort of uh, brought it to life, and, and then I then I had some translations after that. So the, the movie did a, did a lot of good stuff for me and my book, like a big uh, commercial for the book, you know, yeah. pr promoting. But yeah, like, like you said, Iceland is one of the most peaceful countries in the world. It's also uh, one of the most feminist countries in the world, the first female uh, head of state. And then what was it like coming from a country like this and seeing, like, seeing the criticism that happened with American Psycho? Was it popular to say that you liked the book here when you had something like feminists kind of rallying against it? At least uh, like, like, uh, it, some of the writer feminists weren't. They were, they were talking about how brilliant it was. But there was a lot of pushback just because of the graphic scenes yeah. and the treatment of women in it. Of course, this was a different era, you know. We, I think, we are both uh, me and uh, Brett Istomelas uh, coming from this uh, man-only world that that we were brought up in, and and we didn't read uh, women authors, or at least I didn't, and and we didn't really look at the other sex what what they were doing. The, we only looked at them as uh, something sexy, or or we didn't look at their art, or so it was. Um, different kind of uh, culture and and uh, i think the both books are reflect that kind of culture and i i ran into troubles with the feminists uh, when my book came out because i i took this stylistic de device uh, from uh, american psycho that he always describes people mm. by by the designer yeah, yeah, that yeah. they're wearing and and in my book the c the main character is like a slacker and he judges every woman that appears in the book uh, and puts a price on her, how much he's willing to pay for a night with her or to have sex with her. And it's like an ongoing uh, rule throughout the book. And it doesn't matter if it's the president of Iceland or Mother yeah. Teresa or Pamela Anderson yeah. or his best friend's right. friend. or you know. So I had to keep the constant uh, constant rule throughout the book and, and then I ran into trouble I had to put a price on Björk for example and yeah. be decent president and mm. and then I met some some of the women <laughs> you know in the street and they didn't like it and, <laughs> and, and it was um, sensitive of course but but um, you know it, I was trying to explain it's not me you know it's it's, a, it's the character who's yeah. speaking it's it's uh, similar I guess uh, Bateman isn't, isn't totally the yeah. author, you know, right? People have to distinguish between the author and the character, and this uh, sometimes hard for people. They yeah. cannot do this. Be, uh, and I guess one of the differences in uh, American Psycho is reading it again. It's also a very gay book. Yeah, like there is this kind of homoeroticism and, and closeted kind of like pressure. Mm -hmm. Like even the scene with Lewis Carruthers where he's coming in to strangle him, and then it becomes kind of this kind of heartbreaking <laughs> scene where you realize that this is all a front in yeah. a way. And that's way more clear in th the book, obviously, than the movie. For anyone who hasn't uh, read the book, you should. This is the, the book club. But yeah, that's like, so this kind of uh, 80s uh, misogyny as well. There's like this metrosexual homoerotic undertone to the why they're excluding women or, or at least thinking of them as not important yeah. in this way. And it's also a description of this uh, materialistic life, you know, the yuppie culture yeah, and, yeah. and uh, masculinity and, and masculine hell, sort of. It's mm -hmm. like the dark side of New York in a way. And, and I think this book is like, it's high on its own idea. 
Mm-hmm. So like every sentence of the book is intoxicated by the idea behind the book. Mm-hmm. And, and it's like a whole unit, you know, yeah, yeah. And, and, and every sentence of the book is also mirrored in, in this idea, yeah. reflected in the idea. And, and so it's like all good works of art, they, they are like that, you know. They, they, you're energized by the idea the whole time you're reading. You're like sort of, sort of electrified by it by this idea that he's describing yeah. this uh, yuppie hell uh, through through this uh, stockbroker who is a serial killer and uh, that's a brilliant idea i think yeah yeah and it really it really is a hell with the with the line that it starts off with is uh, yeah, yeah 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 referring to dante's inferno yep and so i guess the question i have to ask which is uh, do do you think that he did any of the murders do you think this is a this is a real serial killer in the book or is it a little bit of both? Or is it all in his head? Not all in his head. Uh, I think uh, some of the murders are really yeah. real. Re- uh, that he really did did them. I mean, the he goes to the cleaners and he has all those problems, you know, mm. with butt stains. Uh, yeah, but it always it always seems that like the little flex or the things they're looking at. There's always enough of a excuse that's written in, obviously, to keep uh-huh. the ambiguity that it could be that there's almost okay. nothing. Well. Uh, some of them, are, uh, I think they're in his head, but uh, when he goes insane at the in the end. Uh, but um, for me, uh, I kind of liked it that they, <laughs> they were real. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? I, I like to believe that, uh, at least. Yeah. So, but, yeah, like I said, uh, the the violence part uh, at the time when I read it was not the, the main thing for me. You know, right. So, but, you know, I think I thought it was necessary for, for this idea to work. Yeah, and there's something, and one thing, like you said, this electrifying feeling. I remember, I guess, because I read it ten years ago. I remember all of the labeling and things like that, and I thought of it as like kind of like on and on and on, even to the point where he, he jokes at the end. What are they wearing? You mm-hmm. ask. Mm-hmm. Like there's like a joke right yeah. at the end where you're like, oh my goodness, like he knows how much this is happening. But now I found it. Uh, I found it gave me a space to imagine more than like it was more poetic than I remembered. Like okay. as I was reading it, even if I didn't know the designer, because I'm so used to like scrolling through Instagram images and things like that. Now this is kind of like a poetry of materialism mm-hmm. that I, I can relate to a lot more ten years later. Oh. And how did like, when you're building through it, that kind of electric feeling you're saying is still there? Yeah, and it's always into the latest technology. He's always yeah. trying to get the latest latest gadgets. And, yeah, yeah. and he's <laughs> all eager to, <laughs> to get the internet, but, it, but it's not there yet. Yeah. And, for example, the Walkman is, is the, like the smartphone of the day. And right, right. And uh, it's a totally different world, but, but still there are some similarities. So. Yeah, there is like this thing about him wearing the headphones. Even in the movie, it's like, it seems so rude and kind of like self-absorbed. But now that is how everyone is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <absolutely>. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, like it's hard to talk to anyone yeah, at the dinner yeah. table. Even. I remember I was so self-conscious when I came home from New York in the 80s with the, with the Walkman. I couldn't walk uh, outside uh, in the streets with it. It was like showing off or something. <laughs> there was no other people in, in Reykjavik w- with the Walkman. So my Walkman became like a sit man <laughs> only at home. <laughs> <laughs> Stole this from... Uh, <laughs> 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 Well, uh, thank you very much for joining us here on the live stream. Yeah. What we're going to do now is we're going to go into a, a reading uh, from the book that has been, a video has been made by Colden Martin. He does all the reading and produces the reading videos. And after that, we have an interview with the author of Train Spotting, Irvin Welsh. Vanden tosses the copy of Deception next to Timothy and smirks in a wan, bitchy way. And though I'm pissed off a little that Evelyn doesn't take in Vanden's condescension and hurl it back at her, the JMB has relieved my stress to a point where I don't care enough to say anything. Evelyn probably thinks Vanden is sweet, lost, confused, an artist. Price isn't eating and neither is Evelyn. I suspect cocaine, but it's doubtful. While taking a large gulp from his drink, Timothy holds up the copy of Deception and chuckles to himself. The death of downtown, he says. Then, pointing at each word in the headline, 
who gives a rat's ass? I automatically expect Stash to look up from his plate, but he still stares at the lone piece of sushi, smiling to himself and nodding. Hey, Vanden says, as if she was insulted. That affects us. Oh, <laughs> no, Tim says warningly. That affects us? What about the massacres in Sri Lanka, honey? Doesn't that affect us too? What about Sri Lanka? Well, that's a cool club in the village, Vanden shrugs. Yeah, that affects us too. Suddenly, Stash speaks without looking up. That's called the Tonka. He sounds pissed, but his voice is even and low, his eyes still on the sushi. It's called the Tonka, not Sri Lanka. Got it? The Tonka. Vanden looks down, then meekly says, Oh. I mean, don't you know anything about Sri Lanka? About the Sikhs are killing, like, tons of Israelis there? Timothy goads her. Doesn't that affect us? Cup of maki roll, anyone? Evelyn cuts in cheerfully, holding up a plate. Oh, come on, Price, I say. There are more important problems in Sri Lanka to worry about. Sure, foreign policy is important, but there are more pressing problems at hand. Like what? He asks without looking away from Vanden. By the way, why is there an ice cube in my soy sauce? No. I start, hesitantly. Well, we have to end apartheid, for one, and slow down the nuclear arms race, stop terrorism and world hunger. Ensure a strong national defense. Prevent the spread of communism in Central America. Work for a Middle East peace settlement. Prevent U.S. military involvement overseas. We have to ensure that America is a respected world power. Now, that's not to belittle our domestic problems, which are equally important, if not more. Better and more affordable long-term care for the elderly. Control and find a cure for the AIDS epidemic. Clean up environmental damage from toxic waste and pollution. Improve the quality of primary and secondary education. Strengthen laws to crack down on crime and illegal drugs. We also have to ensure that college education is affordable for the middle class and protect social security for senior citizens. Plus conserve natural resources in wilderness areas and reduce the influence of political action committees. The table stares at me uncomfortably, even Stash, but I'm on a roll. But economically, we're still a mess. We have to find a way to hold down the inflation rate and reduce the deficit. We also need to provide training and jobs for the unemployed, as well as protect existing American jobs from unfair foreign imports. We have to make America the leader in new technology. At the same time, we need to promote economic growth and business expansion and hold the line against federal income taxes and hold down interest rate while promoting opportunities for small businesses and controlling mergers and corporate takeovers. Bryce nearly spits up as absolute after this comment, but I try to make eye contact with each one of them, especially Vanden, who she got rid of the green streak and the leather and got some color, maybe joined an aerobics class, slipped on a blouse, something by Laura Ashley, might be pretty. But why does she sleep with Stash? He's lumpy and pale and has a bad cropped haircut and is at least 10 pounds overweight. There's no muscle tone beneath the black t-shirt. But we can't ignore our social needs either. We have to stop people from abusing the welfare system. We have to provide food and shelter for the homeless and oppose racial discrimination and promote civil rights while also promoting equal rights for women but change the abortion laws to protect the right to life, yet still somehow maintain women's freedom of choice. We also have to control the influx of illegal immigrants. We have to encourage a return to traditional moral values and curb graphic sex and violence on TV and movies and popular music everywhere. Most importantly, we have to promote general social concern and less materialism in young people. I finished my drink. The table sits, facing me in total silence. Courtney's smiling and seems pleased. Timothy just shakes his head in bemused disbelief. Evelyn is completely mystified by the turn of the conversation has taken, and she stands, 
unsteadily and asks if anyone would like dessert. I have sorbet, she says as if in a daze. Kiwi, carambola, cherimoya, cactus fruit, and oh, 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 what is that? She stops her zombie monotone and tries to remember the last flavor. Oh yeah, Japanese pear. How are you? Yeah, very good. I'm in Iceland, so it's we're away from the riprap. Right, yeah. So what's happening there? Is it you locked down or are you free to we, roam? We don't have any active cases in the whole country, but they've had to close the borders. Right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, kind of like a bit like New Zealand. But, well, they've, they've blown up a little bit, but uh, so you're pretty kind of uh, everything. You can just go about your business then, yeah? Yeah, basically. Uh, we still have like restrictions on things and masks and stuff to be careful, but mostly it's pretty normal. Really? Right. So uh, I guess the first question uh, is the kind of the main one. What, what do you think the uh, importance of American Psycho was or the effect it had when it was published? Um, I think it was, uh, it, it it kind of got people thinking about fiction again and what fiction should do um, and what fiction should and, and can be that um, I know it, 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 I mean, it, it sounds a, it sounds like it's a different world now. So, you know, it was, it was much fiction was just generally much more transgressive at that point in time, you know, and, uh, but we didn't, um, we didn't really perceive it as being so, you know, it's always, you're always, um, kicking against things. So back in that, you know, that moment, our kind of perception of things would be, you know, like, you know, as, as writers, it would be that um, there would be very little transgressive fiction around. Whereas it was quite a lot, but um, it was, it was, it was fringy stuff. I mean, if you went into a bookstore, you would have all the, the big titles, but you'd also have stuff by local authors on this, on this desk. And you would have um, kind of, uh, quite edgy, interesting stuff. And, um, but the interesting thing about American Psycho was that it became such a huge mainstream novel and it entered right into the discussion, you know, right, right into the whole discussion of what fiction should be and what, um, what the nature of, um, you know, what, what the nature of art was, um, how it sh should it offend and, uh, and it's very, and, and how should it offend and who should it offend and should it, you know, should it punch up? Should it punch down? Should it punch sideways? All these kind of notions that um, you know that were that we did we we felt um, I think as you know as a society we felt that uh, we were able to discuss these things then and that everything was up for grabs. Uh, we live in a much more anti-art, anti-culture world now, and I think it's harder to um, it's harder to split the talking about something from the reality of actually doing something. So now it was like, um, it would be very, it'd be a very hard novel to get published now, American Psycho. I don't think it would be published. Uh, and it, it would, um, the, I mean, it had a massive, there was a massive furore about it at the time, but, um, which was great, you know, but I think it would be very difficult to publish it now. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting novel also because if you look at it uh, from today's uh, perspective, it is how everyone is. At the time, when I, I read your introduction, you compare Fight Club and American Psycho, and one of them is about kind of the underclass of men, and the other one is this kind of rich Wall Street type. And there's a different, different class difference, but now because of technology, it seems like this over sensation of the rich people in the 80s is now kind of how everyone is. Like we have tabs on our computer where we have porn and then Amazon and then messaging. So everything's kind of been bunched together and we're all kind of Patrick Bateman now. Yeah, I think we're all, we're all unsatisfied and you know, we're, we're, we know that we're all in some kind of dystopian world. 
that we don't really have that much control over. That the the the, the technology is pushing us into strange these kind of strange relationships. So we either you know we almost have this choice to become these um, these uh, almost like kind of robotic and kind of almost silicon based uh, emotionless human beings who never do anything wrong, never kind of say anything wrong, never put a, a, a place out of line. And it's like, um, and the transgression is like the other, the other thing we have is to become like kind of almost like medieval kind of blood simple serfs, basically spewing out hatred and, you know, so we're polarized between these two, these two areas. And I think um, one of the reasons why we're doing that is because we've lost culture and we've lost art, we've lost a place in this whole, this whole technosphere. We've lost a place where ideas and values and aesthetics can be debated and discussed. Now it's very, you're either on kind of one side or the other side. Um, we're forced into false and anti kind of humanist dichotomies by the, the, the power of the technology, the power of information technology. Yeah, and, and something I noticed in your uh, recent broadcast, Offended, is that you, you think that a lot of this might be a, a class issue. This is something in North America where I'm from, I'm from Canada. They don't usually talk about class when they talk about political correctness, but you, you brought that up in the broadcast and you brought it up again in the introduction. Do you think that has something to do with what's going on today? I think so. I mean, I mean we, we live in a, a neoliberal social order and um, it's very difficult to talk about class or to talk about any forms of economic disparity. Um, and almost like, you know, the, we, we, it's almost like, um, when we accepted in the kind of Thatcherite, Reaganite era that this is how we were going to sort of live, and this was, you know, the, the consensus around that. Um, in order to keep that going, we can't really discuss economic equality. It's not on the table. So everybody who was going kind to, of, you know, the, so, so that kind of suits the sort of right-wing controllers. The left-wing controllers have, al have almost um, lost any interest in talking about social class because they've accepted the new liberal order too. So they're talking about things like identity politics, or, you know, and and these things become far more kind of prevalent. So it's almost like there's a there's a there's a tacit agreement between controllers. It's almost like you give us the economic hegemony, and you can do as much social engineering with language as you like, basically. You know, so that's been the, the kind of consensus, the sort of um, uh, uh, a, a kind of um, something that pretends to be progressively economically liberal, but which is very elitist and is all about the concentration of economics. And it's actually very Marxist in its, um, in its kind of um, practical sort of uh, influences uh, on, on the society. And um, the other one, which is um, professes to be about uh, equality and democracy and about letting more people into the mix, becomes very controlling and, and hegemonic because you have to have these are biters of taste. You know, you have to have these influencers on social media. Um, you know, the, the example I've bore everybody with is, you know, if um, 1980, if you got um, two gangs of street kids from opposite sides of town, um, one of them buys a pair of red trainers, you know, and, and he comes back and he shows his pals his red trainers and um, the local hard nut kind of who dominates the gang said, these are cool, I want to get them. So he gets a pair and everybody wants a pair then. So this one guy kitted out in red trainers. The other guy goes back and he wears his red trainers. And the leader of the guy in the local hard nut in the pack goes, these are fucking horrible. These are fucking poofs, faggots, fucking shit. Get them off and all that. You know? So he doesn't wear them again. Um, so these two groups of guys, you know, they think red trainers are hot shit and the other ones that think they're absolutely lame and disgusting. They meet uptown and they get involved in some kind of physical conflict. They, they, they have these wars that are ongoing. They don't know why, but these wars have actually started. And then um, they might meet, kind of a couple of them might meet in a pub later on. And they've maybe been working together, become friends and all this. Stuff. And the testosterone's worn down. They've got into family life and all that. And I remember we used to argue like, fuck about trainers. We used to sort of kind of attack each other in the streets with bread knives and sort of uh, spanners and stuff like that. But at least what, what you had then is you had a, a culture where things were contested out in the, the environment, out in the streets, out and every, everybody was invested in that. Everybody had some kind of a voice in that and it wasn't a, it wasn't a monolithic culture. But now it's like um, 
some kind of um, daft bird with a fat arse like Kim Kardashian will say that red trainers are brilliant or red trainers are shit. And a couple of influencers will say, oh, Kim says that red trainers are brilliant. This is red trainers are great and all that. So kids in their bedroom who get all this shit, they can't contest this with each other. They, they have to, you know, everybody wants to fit in and they have to try to, they're, they're not trying to fit in with their small peer group in the, the, in the, the, the school and the, the local neighbourhood. They're trying to fit in with the whole world. So this consensus, this consensus has been forced on them um, and it's taken away their personality, their ability to, to, act, to argue and to discuss and to debate and to, to actually have an aesthetic, to look at the aesthetic of these trainers and think about how this actually affects them. You know, so that would you know that's an example of how the the culture's changed and how it's kind of constraining. Um, yeah. And when you have, when you don't have that kind of power, what the only power you can get is to become a, a kind of strong armed cultural policeman. You know, I'm going to be the you know, I'm going to be the main. You know, I'm going to I'm going to enforce this. I can't change it. So what I can do, I can enforce it. I can look at this person who might not be a hundred percent right. And I can bully them or harass them or marginalize them. So we have this kind of, um, we have fewer people taking risks and we have a monolithic um, culture emerging, which is media based rather than, um, rather than street based, rather than, um, rather than based around art. Yeah, and that's, that's something that I think uh, young writers would feel as well today is that as soon as you try and put yourself out there, you do feel a global kind of pressure to, to present yourself in a certain way, which is kind of the antithesis to art. Well, I think the thing is, it's like, um, it's for, to, to write now, I mean, it's, 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 it's easier to get published, but it's, it's not easy to have any kind of, it's more difficult to have any kind of platform now. It's like, um, I mean, my own publisher will pick up some young writers and they'll think this, these are the new voices. And then if you don't turn in profit by a couple of books are gone, you know, they're just never heard of again. Oh, yeah. um, whereas when I came through, it was, there was a sense that the publisher would look after your career. You know, would kind of, you would, you would have a, you would have an interface with the publisher and the, and the, the, um, the overseas kind of rights department and the marketing. And they would kind of, they would look at your book and how it, who it can be sold to and what, what you would have to, how you would get involved, and uh, now it's expected to do it online, build up a, an Instagram following or build up a Twitter following, and throw those um, psychic kind of leaflets into their hands, and hopefully they'll buy some books. And if they don't, you kind of you're pretty much fucked, really. You know, it's like it's like or self-publish and hope, and we'll pick it up once you've taken all the risks yourself and you've kind of um, you've spent a fortune, kind of you know, getting this this book out there. And the publisher maybe come along and pick it up after that. Uh, so it's a different environment that people operate in, and um, they're also writing into to genre holes. You know, it's like uh, whereas you know the likes of myself and Brett and Chuck uh, Palinuk and all. When we started out, you know, it was always this thing: just write a book, write the book you want to write, and we might like it, we might not. But now, now if somebody does that, they'll say, well. Is it crime? Is it romance? Is it horror? Is it you know? Is it so? So you're forced to write into this um, this retail-led kind of um, genre hole. You know, there's literally holes on the supermarket um, or the uh, or the bookstore shelf that you have to, that you write into. Um, and uh, so, I mean, something like um, American Psycho, Train Spotting, uh, The Fight Club. These books wouldn't be published now. Yeah. And it, I don't know, but how, what can we, what can you do? It can't be just all despair. Cause I, I when I think of what, it, like I, I, I emailed it to you before, when I, when I discovered you, I got you through your short stories and then got into train spotting. And this was something that got me into uh, Scots, the language got me into reading other Scottish writers like Alistair Gray. Like it, it, this is the sort of stuff that kind of changes your life. And if everyone's being commodified and pushed away and these sort of books aren't being written, what's, What's the future of literature then? It's, yeah, I mean, I'm kind of, um, I'm a bit, um, there's two things that kind of, that are going on really, because, you know, I, I don't, you know, I, I hate to become one of these old fuckers who say to, to you know, to, to young people, that's not as good as it used to be. But I also think we are living in a, an era 
of systemic change, of, of systemic economic change, where everything is going towards zero cost and, um, you know, wages and profits are going to be harder and harder to come by. And, you know, so but, so that's my kind of defence about kind of becoming a, a, a whinge and old uh, sort of guy is, is that the, the, a lot of stuff has been taken away from you. So a lot of the cultural tools have been taken away from them. Um, and I think it's a, the sad thing is it's, it's it's bigger than literature. I think it's about um, it's about art itself and, and about culture in general. And um, we seem to be using technology not to disseminate art and culture, but to disseminate instruction. You know, and we think um, and, and information, and we're confusing we're confusing knowledge and information. You know, knowledge isn't information. You know, we're we're, yeah. we're, we're becoming um, we're we're taught to. To, we can absorb information without actually applying it conceptually to anything. Um, we're not taught to think in a conceptual way. We're not taught to think in a lateral way. It's almost just this kind of um, absorption of, um, of information to service an economy that actually doesn't really exist anymore or, or is kind of frittering away. You know, we, we, don't, we haven't really worked out how we operate this systemic change in the... the the technologically kind of driven decline of capitalism, basically. We don't really know what to do next. Yeah, and uh, another thing that I wanted to kind of ask you about is you've had a number of your works adapted to film, which is something that used to be done quite often. And it was kind of considered, you know, the book is always better. But now uh, the idea of getting even a book adapted to a film is kind of a far off prospect. How do, what do you think when you're adapting transgressive difficult fiction that tackles really kind of uh, graphic or violent images, when you move it to a visual medium, how, how do you think it changes or if you want to keep the essence of the story alive? Yeah, I mean, I think it's like the, the you have to accept that you are moving into a different medium and, it's, and um, with film and TV, see, if I, if I write a book, I just write the book. I don't think about anybody. I'm my own audience. It's a purely selfish act, basically. And um, I don't even think about who's going to read it. But uh, if you try and do that with film, um, straight away, you know, they'll, they'll ask you, you know, the, the people that control the money are going to ask you, like, who is this for? What's our target audience? Who, you know, because they, they want to feel secure that, they, that there's somebody out there that's going to kind of plug, plug into this. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it is, it is, it loses something. It loses, uh, I think, you know, it's, it's a shame that the book isn't as, um, that novels are in the, in the, the decline in some ways. And, you know, the, the, they talk about, you know, the long form TV show being the new novel. And in some ways I think that, that is brilliant, but there's, um, there's also a, an interactive thing with the book. I mean, whenever, whenever you read a book, you're writing your own movie in your head, you yeah, know? Yeah. And your movie is going to be better than anybody else's one. So usually it's like the, you know, the best that the movie can do is to be um, a sort of, uh, is to capture, to keep the spirit of the book and to, to flag up some of the things that um, you as a reader has, has kind of got excited by, you know, but uh, it's never going to be as good. So that, that's why, you know, the book is always, or generally always better than the movie. Yeah, and uh, what about uh, yourself? Are you, are you writing every day still? Are you still planning on continuing all the characters? Yeah, I mean, it's like that thing now that you you become, you, you get to that point where you, you can't really do anything else. You know, you become, <laughs> it becomes kind of um, part of your life. I don't know what I'd be, do if I couldn't write. It's a, it's a bizarre thing to even think about. Um, it's, it's just become such a way of expressing myself as well as my occupation that, um, you know, I still mess around with music, um, but, uh, I think that the great thing about writing is that, you know, and the great thing about the novel is you can just take off and do it on your own. You know, you don't need, um, you know, to, to make a movie, you need other people. To make music, you generally need other people as well, you know, but uh, to do a book, you just have to sit there and by, by yourself. And it's, um, it's a fantastic liberation and engagement with yourself. But I think also for your own kind of um, sanity, you need to do other things too. Yeah. You don't want to be just sitting in a room with people that don't exist all your life. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, uh, thank you very much. This has been exact perfect. This is, uh, I hope um, I hope you enjoyed the interview. Very much, very much indeed, George. Excuse me. Thank you, buddy, and uh, appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, thank you, and uh, have a good day. You too, mate. Thanks. Yeah. Bye. Bye.
turn the speaker off? Hello? And that was Irvin Welsh, the author of Train Spotting. Yeah? And now we have a new guest with us. Uh, this guest has been with us in the other two live streams we've done, which were Brett's Less Than Zero and then The Rules of Attraction. And now you're back again with American Psycho. Yes. This is Mede Kusholt. Hello. The, the Danish sociologist and comedian. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, you, uh, you read American Psycho. A couple of times, yeah. A couple of times. Yes. And did you read it originally in English or Danish? I don't remember. And I don't remember if I saw the book... Uh, saw the movie or read the book first. Okay. Uh, but I remember it was about a decade ago. Mm -hmm. And I remember I did a student presentation on it for my undergrad in English. Okay. Um, but yeah, I've read it in Danish and in English, and I've seen the movie loads. Uh, loads this of times? Uh, yeah, I think so. Okay. And, wha and what's, your in what's your impression of American Psycho? <laughs> well, I don't... I. I don't know if I like it. I'm fascinated by it. Okay. Uh, I I have so many thoughts and opinions, and this this is like some of my notes <laughs> uh, for the book itself, and I have more on my computer and some on my phone. Yeah. Like I have a lot of thoughts. There's so many uh, layers, and I like the fact that I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's really fascinating about it is that there's so many different ways you can interpret it, and there's so many different things you can pull out of it and so many streams you can go down mm -hmm. and what and, wh and what like what would be what what's one of the main thing that stands out to you like so like uh we had Helgrimmer on first and he was saying the big thing was the the music reviews and then also identifying people by what they're wearing mm. is that what stood out to you when you read it as well or was there something else that yeah yeah that was those things uh i think what brad is is really good at and we saw it in the other uh especially in lesson zero mm -hmm little bit in rules of attraction but he's really good at building the world through describing what the characters see and what they do mm -hmm. right so it's very clear what the people think about the people they're with so it's at the same time it's quite uh there's a deep description of the people without actually being very overt about describing people I mean, yeah. obviously, Bateman is very concerned with how people look and what they mm -hmm. do and how they perform certain things. Uh, but it's it has this idea that it's a very superficial n novel and that the people in it are quite superficial. But I think the description of it or the the way that the world is constructed is quite multi-layered. Yeah, it manages to, like, for some reason, just by these surface interactions or the yeah. way they respond or the w things they focus on, it se at first it seems like, okay, this is, you know, very, like you said, superficial, but then it, it kind of, like, it builds this deeper understanding of each character. You, yeah. know, you know what they're thinking about, what they're really interested in, what things they ignore. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned before with the, uh, the music descriptions. Yeah, yeah. And I think the, there was a really interesting... Uh, contradiction from the Genesis chapter and I don't remember if it was directly before or after but where he meets this old school friend mm -hmm. a uh, a character that we don't really need to have like it's a, to me that chapter where he meets his old school friend we don't really need it in the book and I get why it's not in the movie yeah. but at the same time it's very saying to the world so we have this Genesis chapter where Bateman he goes into like minute details and he's as you said he's quite passionate about this mm -hmm. and then in the next chapter he's having he's listening well not even listening to some random guy he doesn't want to have lunch with basically just he's talking about a holiday but the way he talks about this holiday is like he just reads a description yeah, from yeah. a travel magazine <laughs> yeah. right so it's this contradiction between this man's experience of holiday, which seems very superficial or non non passionate, and then this very passionate mm -hmm. description of pop songs. 
Yeah, yeah, and there's, I, I, there is like I, I always found it kind of funny because you know you know the the joke about a family comes home from vacation, invites their friends over, and shows the pictures of them in bathing suits, and it's yeah. cool. it has that sort of like, oh, I don't care what you do when you're not around me. Yeah, but it, what he thinks about is what is most important to him, and, he, and it is kind of like though the the reason that it becomes interesting with the music reviews for me is because he's reaching out to you. He's almost like it becomes mm. that that's the interaction with you, the reader, even if. It's not present. So there becomes yeah. this, like, I'm trying to connect with you, the reader, but even if he seems to not be connecting with yeah. the people around him. But that's him. why I think it worked really well in the movie, where he's... Because they really wanted to have those parts in, the, the f- music reviews. And I think it works really well how they did it in the movie, because he has an audience. Yeah. And I really... Well, he needs an audience. And I really think that if uh, Patrick Bateman were written today, or if he was alive today, a character yeah. or a real person, he would have been... Like a vlogger, yeah, or a podcaster. One of those podcasters who <laughs> films their uh, podcast and broadcast. Well, yeah, it. he um, might be a podcaster. That's yeah. true. Yeah, <laughs> he really he needs an audience, and he needs to have his voice out there and his opinions out there. But he also needs to be there. So it would either be a vlog, sort of like a day in my life, here's yeah. my beauty routine, or a podcast that he would film as well but the different like like uh i talked to Gwyneth Turner later in the podcast and that's and that's that's something that like i i actually uh, after reading the book again i just find it to be two completely different things mm. because there is like these things where he's reaching out to you and the interaction with you the reader and you interpreting what's going on is way different than you have the movie where you're kind of mm. just a observer of things that are happening yeah and the movie is now obviously I can tell it's r- it's written by women and directed by women because it's kind of like a a character of what women fear most. He's like powerful, he's really good looking, and yeah. he's just a psychopath. Yes. Whereas in in the in the book, this is an insecure, unsure, kind of sad, and it's very kind of touching almost how much he wants to exaggerate to impress you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. but that's that's what we. That's because the book is from his perspective. Right. Whereas in the movie, you get to actually see the women's reactions to his... Right. The way he portrays himself or his actions, right? And there's sort of the dynamic of the lived experience of these women who are like, what's going to happen now? Mm -hmm. But 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 Yeah, and it's because like in the... In the movie, I think as well, but in the, in the book, the people that he kills mm. in the book, other than other than Paul Owen, yeah. who's, who's Paul Allen in the movie, yes. uh, other than him, there none of these people are actual people that you n- are connected in his life, and he could get found out with. Yeah. Like these are all kind of no name people that he ends up murdering that you don't know if they really existed mm. at all. Yeah. Wha- you know, and so like, and then also there's a lot of evidence that Paul Owen is really he is in London. Yeah. So like the book. Like, um, I thought, and I, I probably, I'm repeating myself from the interview with Gunnar, I thought that the movie was, like, more saying that, like, that he did it, and that <laughs> I believe Guinevere says that, yeah, yeah he yeah, definitely did it. But in the book, I thought it was just, like, more ambiguous. But now reading it again, I think it's pretty obvious that Patrick Bateman has not committed any murders. Really? I don't think he's committed any murders whatsoever. I, to me, he committed some of them, and then others are just fantasies and hallucinations. I think the so only... So he's, yeah. he's bordering on psychopath psychotic yeah so that's why uh, i like quite like that we don't have the full in the title of the book or in the movie psycho we don't know it's psychopath or psychotic which right. is another double or ambiguity that we don't know but i definitely think some of them are real i think the only violence that he committed was when he kicks lewis carruther in the face <laughs> when he's dragging him in the when he's like embarrassing him yeah. in, in the in the store i think that's the only thing i don't think that I don't think he attacked any other person. Because every other time that there's a chance for him to get confronted or to do something, yeah. it, it, it can be kind of explained away. And he doesn't ever do it in front of anyone. And like Lewis Carruthers, when he is going to strangle him or whatever, that doesn't come forward. Mm-hmm. And then uh, uh, at the end of the book, obviously, with the taxi driver, uh, you know, he gets mugged. He never yeah. seems to be like, in the moment, he never seems to be able to act. And so there is this... And the scene that really kind of pushed this for me, and I think it's one of the... Uh, to me, it's the most one of the like most emotional scenes is when he goes on holiday, and when he goes on holiday in the Hamptons with Evelyn, and for that, oh and yes. for a little bit, he's yeah. just he just has it, and he's able to play this character again, and you can see him, and he's 
just as he exaggerates about the murders, he's exaggerating about the ability to have this kind of romantic getaway. Mm. And then he's walking along the beach at night and collecting jellyfish and microwaving them <laughs> and like <laughs> eating sand. Yeah. Like it just becomes like he can't hold this up anymore. And I, I don't know. I, uh, maybe this is maybe I'm a crazy person, but it reminded me of when you're in a bad when you're just not where you want to be, and you're in a relationship with another person, and you see like you try it and you kind of get it going, and then you just you slowly just start wandering the beaches and eating sand and <laughs> microwaving jellyfish again. I just I found it like I think I think he's such a relatable character that it's weird to say because I used to think of American Psycho when I was younger as similar to like Lolita, where I would be mm. nervous reading it on the bus yeah. because people would be like, oh, okay. Yeah. But now, but now after reading it again, I feel kind of like, yeah, this was, this is a really impassioned kind of, uh, smart work about male insecurity. In this case, I think it's, there's the, the gay undertone throughout the whole oh, yeah. thing. That's very Definitely. obvious, but I think it's relatable to everyone because the one big, uh, I don't know, this is big difference is that men are kind of like, crazy dominating violence in their mind yeah uh, even just ev almost everyone from what they study they just say like i don't know there's all these <laughs> sort of things like psychotic and psycho but men are men have these kind of reactions and insecurities and there's things. uh there's a thing called i think it's called stupid man syndrome and i think that's a scientific name for it yeah this is sort of adrenaline fueled testosterone fueled Men are just stupid and take stupid risks. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's science, guys. <laughs> um, yeah. I d oh, okay. So you see a lot of yourself in... Uh, well, you know, like, um, actually, because we're, we're going to go into it. <laughs> I see a lot of myself in touch with it. Wow. <laughs> hey, guys. No, no. But it's no, but, but really, I, I think, you know, because that is funny, because he is such a character that's memed, and we know American Psycho, and we, and we have this kind of idea. Even people who haven't read the book have an idea of what they think it is. Yeah. But I, I don't think they're right in this way. I think this is, I think this is like every, it's just to an extreme level, to such an extreme level that, you know, he has every part of me in him, even if I don't have every part of him in me, which I'm saying this because I'm going into the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay <laughs> guys yeah if anyone yeah. anyone's watching i'm i haven't murdered anyone yet, yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, but i think it is i think that like that's why it's that's why it's a novel and not a movie is because yeah. it is this it is about like it is about this kind of like what happens when you are bombarded with these images and mm. bombarded with these expectations and bombarded with all this stuff to, to achieve something, how do you respond in your imagination? What, what, is it, where is it, what is the imagination's role to deal with all of this sensory overload? And I think that's kind of what the book kind of hits with me. I don't know. I, I'm taking over the commentating. Yeah, I feel like... Because also, yeah, I'll, I'll, sorry, I'll interrupt one more time. And then, <laughs> then the such a man. I know, such that's a, a man. That's also science, guys. And that's what I want to go on to the, the... The thing is, women read literary fiction more than men do. Uh -huh. any, any writer's audience is mostly women, and American Psycho would have been read mostly by women. Even when you advertise like an event like this, it's about... It's either 50-50 or 60% women that are interested over men just in talks about literature. Uh -huh. So this is something that, even though it has this misogynistic, males-oriented, women are interested in this, and it is something that like p uh, women are obviously consuming and reacting to and feeling it's something they want to know about, which also I find interesting, because guys might like the movie because they want to look like Christian Bale, yes. but not a lot of them are going to sit down and, and go through a 400-page novel. Because women have more patience? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Because yeah, like you said, I you're was that a question? I don't know. It wasn't a question. I'm just saying what it's uh, yeah. it is it is interesting that uh, it, it's like all of this brings up all these questions about men, but the people yeah. who are really the ones that are kind of diving into oh it, yeah, yeah, are like yourself. Like you said, it's something that you're you're not sure if you like it, but you're fascinated by it. Yes, yeah, I think is I don't consider him relatable as a person as much as just an empty shell you can put your own stuff into yeah because y this book can be read in so many different ways is it a comedy is it horror like what do you focus on so i think it's interesting that you focused on like <laughs> grabbing on to yeah elements of his well i, I just kind of because when I, now when i think about all the images and things i could see at any given moment uh -huh. the graphic stuff didn't really that wasn't what i was going for oh I, I I, this was one of the fr only 
uh, instances of book that made me physically sick. <laughs> like yeah. nauseous from, really? from some of the graphic. Yeah. yeah I yeah. had to skip lines. Okay. Yeah. It I hit me. I, I found that they were like hard. Yeah. And then sometimes they were so ridiculous. Like near the end where he started drinking his own urine, I was like laughing out loud. Yeah, because yeah. I'm like, now it's getting. But, it, but the pigeon rat. You know, from The Simpsons, like he, he pre- like The Simpsons kind of covered that when Bart's twin in the horror House of Horrors. I don't know why I'm bringing this up, but like a lot of the stuff there has just become so little chunks of it have influenced so many different yeah. elements of pop culture that I, I kind of just could go through all the violent stuff and was like, yeah, I, I, I knew I knew what I was getting mm. into when I started this book, and so I was more interested in the development of a person's imaginative reaction. Like I feel like this whole book is like a panic attack. Oh, it definitely. Uh, I feel like it's, it's an ag- anxiety. Yeah, delving deep into an anxiety attack or a psychosis, really. And there's a like f- three, four pages towards the end where it switches into a third person narrative, mm-hmm. which is, well, I guess simple. It's like a out of body experiences, right? Yeah. And that he's not fully there, but he's just kind of observing himself or. He's talking about having like blackouts and sort of waking up in the middle street or right. waking up in a phone box calling Jean, and then he's watching himself do these things. So mm-hmm. yeah, I think it's definitely a psychosis. Yeah, that, yeah. So I, I don't, I don't think psychosis necessarily. But I guess it has to be if it's like these delusions. But there yeah. is this kind of like it feels like, like I called it. I think when I was writing down notes, like panic attack poetry, like the <laughs> stuff that you would just go through and just when you're having just completely an anxiety yeah. attack or panic attack, the stuff that you would just say or think or imagine because you can't handle it anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, all the lists towards the end, the lists get quite random as well. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. And just like the some of the delusions, like a bench chasing them or a talking vagina. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, it has something to it. But you know, on that note, uh-huh. I do have a, a great thing. So as I said at the beginning, if you were watching the intro, this uh, live stream was brought together by patrons of the Brady Stanalis podcast, which uh, you can sponsor on Patreon and, and listen to, and I recommend it definitely. But uh, one of the patrons that follows the podcast, who uh, is very active also in the Facebook group that we have, he's a, a certified uh, psychotherapist, Ooh. and he agreed to kind of talk about what he would if he was analyzing Patrick Bateman as a uh, patient, what what his diagnosis would be. And so yes. we have uh, Jeremy L. Lanning uh, right now. Uh, an interview I did with him, I, I did a pre-recorded it before. I'm wearing a different shirt. There's no tricks in this one. So, okay, it started recording, and then what I'll do is, how you'll start off is you'll just say, hi, uh, I'm Jeremy, L- your name, I'm a patron mm-hmm. of the Freddy Stanellis podcast, and I'm a professional psychotherapist, and then I'll ask you uh, about Patrick Bateman. Okay, what's the best way to, so it's not awkward, what's the best way to, to draw this to an end? To draw it to an end? Uh, to draw it to an end is, like, uh, by by making it less formal so like as you come to the end of your thing into your like and that's you know and then you can say like like what you did earlier you could be like but you know the the analysis of patrick bateman takes up a, a quarter a, like a corner of the internet there's a lot of bad graduate papers on this and none of them are very good but there's there's a lot to talk about you know like you can end with that sort of thing so that that's how you kind of get out of the conversation okay perfect yeah, because that, 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 that way it leaves it open-ended a little bit, so you don't have to say that you've covered everything. <laughs> I wanna, right, yeah. That yeah. Place, and so then I guess when I when I said that place, I guess that's just a cue to you that I'm that I really have nothing left. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. And then I'll just be and, like, so uh, as a person who, who re- like a, a reader, and then I'm gonna switch it over to your thoughts on being a psychotherapist and a reader, and uh, and Brady Snellis type stuff. And uh, like I have like, yeah, that's about it. That sounds perfect. Okay. Okay. 
Uh, yeah, anytime you can just, uh, you'll start and then I'll ask you the question. So you just say, hi, your name. I'm a patron of the Betty Stanley's podcast. And I'm also a professional psychotherapist. And then I'll ask you, so as a professional psychotherapist, what can you tell us about Patrick Baker? Sure. Perfect. Okay. Well, hello, my name is Jeremy Lanning and I'm a licensed professional counselor and psychotherapist. And I'm here in uh, Fort Worth, Texas. I'm a uh, patron of the Brett Easton Ellis podcast and a big fan. And also I'm a card carrying member of, of generation X. And so this novel was a, was a, um, a highlight of my coming of age, so to speak in the early nineties, uh, with Gen X being typically born in the seventies, grew up in the eighties, came of age in the nineties, that sort of thing. And so this book was a big deal to me. And so I'm happy to be a part of this. Um, even if it's from a, a professional sort of sort of non-professional uh, assessment of the Patrick Bateman character. And so I'm real thankful to be able to be doing that. Oh, so can you, uh, can you tell us a little bit about how would you go about analyzing a character like Patrick Bateman? So, the, so that's what's super interesting, right? Uh, one of the things that's actually really difficult is Hello, making my any name kind is of Jeremy assessment Lanning, of a fictional and character. I'm a licensed and, professional And I'll sort of tell counselor. you why. And so I've worked professionally in a clinical setting, which is in a hospital setting. And I work as a counselor as well. I also do uh, disaster mental health and on-scene trauma and a lot of stuff like that. And one thing I can tell you is that fiction doesn't come anywhere near reality. And so when you're working with a real person and you're looking for a diagnostic criteria, it's actually pretty easy because they're not making it up. You know, they have symptoms just like you would if you had the flu. You know, and so it becomes very difficult when you talk about fictional characters, because in the, in the world of fiction relating to people, the mind is actually very limited. You know, the things that I've heard in the counseling room or in a clinical setting, they're so far beyond what fiction has to offer. So when you're taking a, a uh, I mean, both in scope and intensity. So when you're taking a fictional character, you're actually, this is, was my experience with this little part of the project, you actually find yourself doing a, more of an analysis of the author. You know, you, it's, you actually get more of an idea of the person that created this fictional character than you do the actual character themselves, right? And so that was part, that's, that's part of the tricky thing about diagnosing or getting an, what we call a diagnostic impression of fictional characters, right? And so like in one of my abnormal psych graduate classes, they would give you movies and fictional characters and they would, you would just struggle with the diagnosis for weeks, you know, and before you realize you're actually thrown off by the, uh, by the fiction of it all. And so Patrick, Patrick Bateman is no exception because anybody that's read that book knows, man, that book is all over the place. Like his symptomology is dripping, you know, all over the page. And what's interesting enough about the diagnosis of Patrick Bateman is he tells us in the beginning of the book, you know, he refers to himself, the, the, the quote where he whispers to himself that he's a fucking evil psychopath. You know, there's that, it's right at the beginning of the book. And the book is called American Psycho, right? <laughs> and, and he tells us he's a, he's a psychopath, which actually isn't a diagnosis, which most people don't know. And so psychopath, sociopath, and insane. Hello, my are, name is Jeremy Lanning. And legal I'm terms, a, cultural terms, things like that, but they're not, they're not diagnostic terms, right? So for Patrick Bateman, you know, you first have to start with an idea of, of uh, what his symptomology is, which leads, at least somebody in my position, which leads you right to, um, to antisocial personality disorder, right? That's the diagnosis for the most part. And then from that diagnosis, people will typically refer to those folks as psychopaths or sociopaths, depending on their actions, if, if that makes sense if that makes any sense. You can, you can be uh, antisocial and personality disordered and not be a homicidal maniac, right? So, so at some point it comes down to what's the behavior, um, what's the behavior of the person, uh, if that makes any sense, and then what's their, what's their level of functioning? So that's that part of it specifically. And then the other part of it too is, is it real or not? You know, do we have a different diagnosis if Patrick Bateman is actually committing all these horrific, and I mean horrific upon second reading, horrific acts of uh, violence, um, or is he just, or is he hallucinating? 
you know, or are these fever dreams? Or is my impression, could it be somewhere in the middle? You know, is, is, is that, would, that would be my thought as a professional. For me, it's always uh, something in the middle, not quite what it presents itself. And so, so that's the, inter to me, that's the interesting part when looking at a character like Patrick Bateman. And you don't have to go very far into the book to get an idea of what you're reading, right? Because um, the author traps us as a reader, at least, at least in my opinion, right? So from the opening line um, from Dante's Inferno to the last line from Sartre's No Exit, you're, you're trapped, you know? Yeah. This is not, exit is at the end and, you know, the, the um, what, what's that, what's the, uh, what's that first line of the book? The uh, abandon all hope, ye who enter here, right? And so you're, you're, you're brought into the madness and then at the end, you can't find a way out. This is not an exit. You know, you're lost. And so you're trapped in the madness of Patrick Bateman, even as the reader in the book. Anyway, and so as, as looking at it through my second reading, because um, I think I've connected with you before I started my second reading. I haven't read the book since, I think, 92, 91, whenever the last time I read it was, you know. So now I'm a, I'm a professional. I'm a father. I'm a middle-aged man. You know, I'm, on, I'm the... I'm the I'm the old timer now, you know, the Gen X guy, right? So the second reading was pretty interesting to, to say the least. And my experience with that was trying to look at it professionally, but also feeling trapped and also finding myself learning more, at least in my opinion, right? About the author's state of mind um, when, when we're reading the book. And so that, that, that was the diagnostic impression that I came, came away with. Um, and you know what? People might disagree. You could get 10 professionals on here who, but, but probably not. <laughs> There's also um, the book that we use is called the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual. It's what we use to do diagnosis, right? And um, in version five, they have what's called cluster B, dramatic, emotional, and erratic cluster. And here's where, this is kind of the last thing I'll say about the, about the diagnosis part of it. But Inside of that cluster, you have borderline personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, histrionic personality disorder, and antisocial personality disorder, right? So by today's, today's uh, diagnostic standards, Bateman would fall into the cluster B symptoms, and he would be primarily um, the antisocial personality disorder. Then the question becomes, is it real? Is it not real? Because then now we're talking about, is he eccentric, criminal, or crazy? That's the running joke, right? You know, if somebody's wealthy and has means, they're eccentric. If they're poor, they're crazy, you know, or are they criminal? So that's the, the popular culture diagnosis usually is, is sort of one of those three things. But, and there are some examples from the book, you know, that, that, that specifically stand out. My, my favorite chapter of the book happens to be or should I say journal entry, right? Because these chapter titles read like journal entries almost, which is my favorite one is the Chase Manhattan. I just think that's so clever. But anyway, Tunnel is probably my favorite chapter of the book as, as a psychotherapist, you know, because, um, and I think this might be valuable to, to, to those watching, right? Tunnel is, is an interesting chapter because it was when my complete view towards the book changed from the time I read it the, the first time, which is, you know, Bateman and I think it's Price, you know, they're trying to score cocaine. They're desperately trying to get high. They can't get the night off, you know, and they're, and they're, they're, they're in the bathroom skeptical of the, uh, of the cocaine they bought. There's a lot of NutraSweet jokes and things like that. My point is that the image that I got from that chapter of these guys running around town, living in the moment, absolutely no regard for the past or the future, just trying to get high reminded me of being a young adolescent running around town with my friends trying to score candy, you know, and, 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 you know, desperately trying to go from one moment to the next. And that's when I really got the feel of, okay, so Bateman, we've got no past. He's almost incapable of, of even thinking about the future. And what past we have is very little. We learn later in the book that his mom, I think may or may not be senile and institutionalized a very quick a very quick thing. So you get this idea, at least in my opinion, that that Bateman is suspended along with the rest of his cohorts in this adolescent sort of fever dream that I think really kicks it off in that chapter tunnel, which to me is um, is is 
is kind of my favorite chapter because that's where we get the what's called the personal fable. So, and this is important to Bateman's character. The personal fable is also called the adolescent fable, which is if I'm an adolescent, I tend to think that the world is is as preoccupied with me as I am with myself, right? Now in adolescence, that's normal for their survival because their world is so harsh, right? But when adults carry over adolescent behavior, then you get real problems. You get personality disorders, you get those kinds of things. And so anyway, so Bateman exemplifies that where he's, he thinks the world is, is as obsessed with him as he is with himself. And that creates this fable. And to me, in those beginning chapters, even with the first chapter being called April Fools, I mean, they're, the, the author may be telling you, <laughs> you know, that you're in for a ride. Um, anyway, so yeah, in, that, in those first handful of chapters, until you get the first sort of mention or thought of violence, which I think is Bateman with the, with the bartender. Um, I, I can't remember which chapter that says, but, but anyway, up until that point, it's such a wild ride, those first, those first few chapters. And so, um, so anyway, so in general, you know, that's my, that's my diagnostic take on it, you know, and, and I thought it was such an interesting part of the read because in the beginning of the book, it's almost like reading the old Testament or these big features of big, religious literature you get all these names thrown at you and all these characters thrown at you and you're and it's overwhelming and you're, you start getting confused but then you get through those first few chapters and you're like wait everybody's the same i don't actually really need to keep up with anybody it's like uh the image i get of the characters in american psycho is like my my son has this little bin full of lego people and it's all these mixed mashes of lego people and there's just all these different people and different parts of the people and I sort of got that feeling getting really sucked into the to to the book and so you know that that's um anyway so that's my sort of diagnostic impression I guess from a professional standpoint looking at a piece of pop culture um uh, for what that's worth Yeah, so there was a, a little bit of a technical difficulty in the last last bit of the interview, but we played the beginning where I was coaching them. I hope that it didn't bother you too much. But before I, we get to our next guest, uh, we have another reading by Colden, Colden Martin. This is a short one, and then we'll get right on to our next guest. Listen, I say, pushing my chair in. I just want everyone to know that I'm pro-family and anti-drug. Excuse me. As I walk away, Van Patten grabs a passing waiter and says, his voice fading, Is this tap water? I don't drink tap water. Bring me an Evian or something, okay? Would Courtney like me less if Lewis was dead? This is the question I have to face with no clear answer burning back across my mind as I make my way slowly through the dining room, waving to someone who looks like Vincent Morrison, someone else who I'm fairly sure is someone who looks like Tom Newman. Would Courtney spend more time with me, the time she now spends with Lewis, if he was out of the picture, no longer an alternative, if he was perhaps dead? If Lewis were killed, would Courtney be upset? Could I genuinely be of comfort without laughing in her face, my own spite doubling back on me, giving everything away? Is the fact that she dates me behind his back what excites her? My body, or the size of my dick? Why, for that matter, do I want to please Courtney? If she likes me only for my muscles, the heft of my cock, then she's a shallow bitch. But a physically superior a near perfect looking shallow bitch and that can override anything except for maybe bad breath or yellow teeth either of which is a real deal breaker would I ruin things by strangling Lewis 
If I married Evelyn, would you make her buy our lacrosse gowns until we finalized her divorce? Have the South African colonial forces and the Soviet-backed black guerrillas found peace yet in Namibia? Or would the world be a safer, kinder place if Lewis was hacked to bits? My world might. So, why not? There really is no other hand. It's really even too late to be asking these questions since I'm now in the men's room, staring at myself in the mirror, tan and haircut perfect, checking out my teeth which are completely straight and white and gleaming. Winking at my reflection, I breathe in, sliding on a pair of leather Armani gloves, and then make my way toward the stall Lewis occupies. The men's room is deserted. All of the stalls are empty except for the one at the end, the door not locked left slightly ajar. The sound of Lewis whistling something from Les Miserables getting almost oppressively louder as I approach. That was another reading by Cold Martin. And now we have uh, another guest here on the live stream. Uh, this is Bjorn Helderson. You were here uh, for the Rules of Attraction live stream, and you've joined us again with American Psycho. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, first impressions. Well, this was my first time reading the book. Uh, I saw the movie back in the day, and I rewatched it now. But this was the first time when I sat down and actually read the whole thing. And it was interesting just having been exposed to it through the movie. We sort of, you guys touched on this before. But I, I kind of, yeah, I felt, I felt it odd how uh, the movie sort of missed out just how pathetic he is in many mm -hmm. ways. And just, he, like, whenever he's around these, like, other men, there's always this establishing of the pecking order. He's constantly worrying about where he lines up with everyone else. Mm -hmm. And I could see how in the movie they tried to address some of those points but it a lot of it felt l more like just oblivious mach machoism mm -hmm. than that sort of like deep insecurity that hides behind it in many ways yeah it, it feels like like uh when you don't have these kind of like uh these entries these other things there like uh, like from the text basically if you don't read it for 400 pages mm -hmm. it, it, it is just you know you could just you could read little sections just like the reason it got canceled or got uh like simon and schuster stopped it is because they took little sections out of context and people were like oh this is horrible how adorable is that though like can you imagine do you think there's going to be books banned anymore that, like <laughs> outdoor how great is that that books were important enough to get banned i feel like we've kind of <laughs> lost that a little bit now like I, I have a hard time imagining sort of a banned book yeah <laughs> currently that's sort of gone with the past I, you know hopefully they'll start banning books again it might make things a little bit more interesting yeah <laughs> Finally, like, but like you said, like if, if 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 you could ban a book out of just reading these little violent passages, which the the movie becomes kind of stuck together in this way, but it makes it so that they are two different things. I think it's a oh completely yeah. different totally, and uh, and definitely the experience of the book is passing through this entire thing in this way. And I find this was another thing that I took from it that I found very fascinating is his sheer use of repetition and lists that there's always there's these lists throughout where he lists what everybody's wearing, but there's always a sense of repetition always. There's certain mm -hmm. phrases that pop up in almost every single chapter. Yeah. When he references, you know, what was on the Patty Winters show this right, morning, right. which constantly changes, but it's sort of front dated. It's the same sentence structure over and over again. Right. And then the constant rephrasing of, like, that he has to go return videotapes. Right. So it's sort of... And that becomes, it kind of adds to this almost like monotonous, like jadedness of everything and mm. even transports over into the violence where towards the end, like you begin, you're skipping because it's, you know, graphic and horrific, but towards the end, you're kind of skipping or sort of glancing through the text because you're just so jaded by it that, <laughs> that it's hardly going in anymore, even as graphic and as horrific as it is. Yeah, there's, there's there, like... I don't know. I, I didn't. I didn't skim this time, but I remember the first time I, I skimmed. But this time I was kind of well because I'm focused <laughs> on doing it in this yeah. way. But I found I found that if like when you engage in it, it's not it's not a slog or anything like that. I've heard people say like it's a, a tough book to get through. I, I didn't find this was a. I found it was kind of uh, 
section by section, it got more and more exciting a bit to where the jokes, like the jokes like I mentioned before, any joke at the end where it's just he's going just now he's drinking pee or uh, now he's asking like, hey, would you like another description? Like oh I yeah. said, this is this is like this is a 300 page <laughs> joke. Like this is something where it's like, hey, have you been paying attention? Well, here's the payoff. And the, the Groucho Marx joke. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the, the Groucho the, Club. The Groucho Club. And he's like, well, if you're the type of person who says that you're the, like, you know, I wouldn't go into a club that I could be a member of. He just elongates that joke into a whole paragraph rather than two sentences. So there is this kind of like, if you're paying attention, these are the jokes, which is, I believe, why uh, there's a, a YouTube uh, document. Oh, it's a documentary from the BBC or something like that where they covered Brett East, the world of Brett Easton Ellis mm -hmm. but a, lo a long time ago. And uh, Will Self, a writer in that, says, if you really want to enjoy American Psycho, read it in one sitting. Because then you, then you get all the jokes. I, of course, I tried to do this, <laughs> and then I failed miserably. Yeah. Just because life got in the way and everything like that. But uh, I, I wish I could have. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it definitely puts little placeholders in there to sort of as you pass through, and it sort of references itself back and forth. And it even has that, uh, I've got <laughs> like my elbow here, because I'm a big Gertrude Stein fan, it says a rose is a rose is a rose. Yeah. In the book, it's a rolls is a rolls is a rolls. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's definitely, the, yeah, that's a phrase that pops up, I think, during the lunch. He's having it with Evelyn when his mind just starts drifting. Yeah, yeah. So it's definitely like there's references to that, I think. Oh, yeah, it's, it's chock full of, it's because it is kind of like pop culture and what's going on, but there's this kind of undercurrent of literary comments or anything well obviously with the beginning like we've already said oh yeah with dante with dante but then but you know throughout it there's constant references to stuff if you're paying attention yeah i think um uh, the sociologist whose name i've forgotten sorry uh he also referenced that the final line which he said was from sartre from the play the no exit play. right 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 I, I always thought of it kind of like uh, you've entered hell and now you can't get out like there right, is yeah. no exit yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah so Anything else you'd like to add about American Psycho? I mean... You brought some notes. It, it's fascinating just reading it now, just in the world that we enter now, because I was reading the sort of Wikipedia articles about it and whatever, sort of prepping the last minute trying to pick up something, and they there's all these comments from the time about how it's, you know, it's actually this hard-hitting satire about consumerism and everything, and it doesn't really feel like that. It, it does feel like that, but it seems like such an obvious read just because yeah. the way it's being listed and right. everything. And it feels more, uh, you've kind of, you talked about this and I think uh, with Irvine Wells, you talked about this a little bit. It's just the sheer sort of like, he, he seems to be losing his grip of reality, particularly through images, just this constant yeah. wash of images uh, and, and it made me think of um, Red Pill by Ari Kunshru, which I just read recently, which also features heavily Donald Trump and is written and it sort of takes place in the mm -hmm. months leading up to the 2016 election. And it's in that, it's a very kind of weirdly prophetic document in that way, just in how yeah. it, it fits into our current moment that we're having now. Yeah, it, it, that's like the thing that I, the biggest takeaway I had reading it today was that it is, he predicted this kind of mindset or feeling that everyone has now, like where everything is kind of flattened together, like I was saying in the interview or in the intro, where we shop, we have our porn, we have Tinder, everything's on the same screen and they're considered equal. And he treats all these things equal, which seemed, you know, psycho at the time. But now that is kind of how everyone is. And then to predict that Donald Trump would be something that people were obsessed with, and Ben and Jerry's <laughs> would get political. Like it, there's a point where there's a Ben and Jerry's right oh at a yeah, yeah, yeah. and it gets political. This is this is like it's amazing that he was able to intuit that this is the way people were thinking. And it makes me think, and this is I'm gonna go, this is as far out of a theory as I'm gonna go, is that the very people who made the world we're in today are the people he's writing about then. And if computer code and the way websites are built is a language just like English or something like that and it's an, a kind of an art form in that way, we are getting their mind imprinted on us, just like you get when you, when you read any art, you get a little bit of the artist who made it, like you get that reflected back at you. And now in this corporate culture that we have today, what he was analyzing, or at least kind of trying to exemplify in American Psycho, is now what everyone lives in. That's, the, that's the, the stuff we're filtering through. This is how we live, is this world built by those Wall Street people today. I think there's a, that's why it feels so prophetic. It's almost like uh, one of these 
like the next five minutes sci-fi, which seems like it was a contemporary type thing, but it has a, it, it did end up predicting quite I a bit. I don't know. I mean, he is definitely he is a writer of sort of of the visual image, of like TV channels, of MTV, yeah. of this sort of thing. And ever since like the 80s, it feels like we've been experiencing this sort of collective thing through basically Western like uh, United States nostalgia. Mm-hmm. Like I, I know exactly everything about Happy Days without having seen any a single episode of that just because it gets repeated endlessly in like other television shows that I, yeah. that I uh, have experienced. And he, he's sort of, he's a very much a writer of that generation. Right. So it's c- sort of those echoes that echo through his work. They they follow th- follow on, and, th- and that's and that's what's happened to American Psycho in a way. It's become part of the collective conscious because everyone's got an idea of what they think it is because of the movie, and then the way it's been memed, like it's used quite a bit online. That if you actually read the book, it's a completely different experience because I didn't realize how far my remembering of it or remembering or understanding of it had drifted just by being constantly reading articles or things that are compared to Patrick Bateman or having friends be like, oh, I'm in my Patrick Bateman phase because they're going to the gym. That was, that's right. a person in Iceland who said that to All me. Right. And they were like <laughs> proud of it. So this is like, this is a, this is a thing where it took a life of its own to the point where when you go back to the text, you realize it's, it is a completely different well, thing. Well, I mean, so much of that was through the movie, obviously. Yeah. And that's a fascinating thing that I know you're going to get to next, basically. But it is odd. It, it feels, because it, I watched it recently and it, it feels like Christian Bale, there are these scenes that sort of capture this like neurosis that he's just constantly in the crux of. But there's something about being outside that and looking at him and sort of looking at sort of this like chiseled <laughs> like masculinity that's on display there. That there is stuff that gets a little lost in a way. like Because mm-hmm. he's just constantly just caught in his own insecurities throughout the entire book. And... And I know, and you got, you were speaking earlier about whether people thought the murders happened or not. And I, I think I definitely fall in the line of, uh, maybe also because it, it's uh, fronted by uh, a quote from Notes from the Underground by Dostoevsky. But I definitely fall in the line of this is, this reads to me, it's, remember that cop in Brooklyn that got arrested, like cannibal cop, remember that story? Uh, no, I don't. No, no, it was it was a great little like New York Post story, like yeah. Cannibal Cop and everything. But I was like, uh, there, there was a man he got arrested for basically like writing fantasies about eating other people, and he was a New York policeman. Yeah, yeah. And this feels like one of those found documents a little bit to me, or at least that was the reading I had. It was, it was someone sort of pouring all their frustration about their position in the world and all their issues with women. No, and I'm not speaking about uh, Brett Easton, <laughs> I should specify. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I sort of like, I had this, just I, I had a f- sense of a protagonist somewhere beyond Bateman that was sort of pouring all these like horrific fantasies that he had nowhere else to put but the page throughout. That was sort of the reading that struck out me out at me while I was going through it this time. Oh, well, perfect. That's a, that's a great way to segue <laughs> into the next interview. Thank you. Uh, so now the next interview, like he was saying, uh, we have the screenwriter, the co-screenwriter of the American Psycho film adaption, Guinevere Turner. Uh, I'm here with Guinevere Turner, one of the screenwriters, the co-screenwriter of American Psycho, the film adaption. Uh, how are you doing? I'm great, thanks. So uh, I guess the first question I would have to ask, how did you get, how did, how did it come to you adapting American Psycho with Mary Heron, right, the Canadian director? Yes, Mary Heron uh, and I were working on a film, a screenplay together uh, about uh, the pinup girl, Betty Page. And she was approached to um, do the adaptation uh, to, and also to direct the film, the adaptation of American Psycho. And she, we were already working together and she said, you're gonna hate me <laughs> um, because I know you're gonna hate this book and you don't like scary, gory things, but I would, uh, I think that we could make a really great um, 
feminist, interesting, funny uh, movie uh, out of it. And so I read the book and I was like, yes, I hate you. And I hate this Brett Ellis character, whoever he is. <laughs> when I first met Brett, I was like, one of the first things I said, I was like, what is your fucking problem? <laughs> like, it's such a crazy book. Um, and, and so uh, I did uh, also find it hilarious and interesting and, and uh, complicated and, and something that could, could become a good movie. So I toughed it out. With the, with the content of the book, which is probably almost everyone who's listening to watching this right now knows, uh, it can be extremely rough at times. That book, American Psycho. Yeah, and your your adaption, like you select obviously when you do an adaption because it's quite a large book, and you're making it into this kind of hour fifty minute film or so. So how did how did you how did you change your adaption and angle so that you got the the film you wanted to produce, the adaption that you? Well, it's a really tricky book, and and we, Mary Heron and I, were the sixth people or person or people team to to tackle it. So it was uh, kind of I think at the end of its rope in terms of actually becoming a film because nobody could seem to figure out how to how to do it. And it's challenging because uh, you know there are entire chapters that aren't don't have a plot. They're just uh, you know music reviews basically in Patrick Bateman's voice. And then there is, uh, you know, endless cataloging, cataloging, listing off of, uh, you know, suits or, you know, style stuff, just stuff, fancy stuff uh, and how to do that. Um, and then, you know, if one were, there, there, there's a version of that book that could be a really intense movie in terms of violence. And so what we knew was that we loved the music stuff. How did we, how do we, how do we integrate that? How do we make it cinematic? Um, that we didn't, we didn't really think we needed to find a cinematic way to replicate the endless, um, that that works on the page, but I don't know how it would work in a movie. Uh, and then um, we decided that <laughs> hilariously, we were like, you know, the book is ambiguous about whether or not it's all in his head. And we don't like movies where things are, we're all a dream, we're all in someone's head. So we're gonna make it very clear that he's really killing people. Number one question that comes out of people's mouths when they talk to me about this movie is, was it all in his head? And I'm like, damn, we failed. Uh, we failed in terms of, we didn't, clearly it's still ambiguous. It's um, as ambiguous as it is in the book, I guess. Um, uh, but did you fail if people are arguing about the end of your movie? Say um, a young man on Reddit arguing with me about the meaning of the ending. Of the movie. <laughs> I, I don't because I, I, I like both and I, and actually uh, I saw the, I saw the movie first before I, I read the book. Mm. But the, the big difference, like I, I now because I'm rereading it and going over it and kind of trying to figure out exactly how I feel about each part, the the book really comes off as he didn't do it. Like, that it's all in his head, yeah. It's all in his head, and the book seems to be more about a relationship with you, the reader, than it is about, like, than, than you could possibly do with a movie, whereas the movie is very obviously uh, kind of, like, more, it's like the book is kind of like a, the anxieties of a gay man who's, like, closeted, or at least yeah. isn't expressing it, and then the, the movie is very much, a, you can tell that it's written by a woman once you know, almost. Because you, it's so shocking that you think what, and then you go over it and you're like, oh, this has a really, it's almost like the ending is about the patriarchy in a way. To be like a buzzword today, like all these people are complicit in him getting away with his crimes, and it's kind of it's there, and he is doing it, but he doesn't even know if he's guilty or not. It's it's got a really relevance to a lot of the stuff being spoken about today. It feels like I know. I mean, I I rewatched it recently, and uh, was sort of. Um, well, I was cringing a little bit at, because we have Trump jokes. We have two Trump jokes. Uh, not cringing, just cringing for all of humankind when like, at, when that was actually a funny joke to make. You know what I mean, Len? He was just a punchline and not destroying the world. Um, but it does feel like uh, the conver that, that it's that the term toxic masculinity is really what we're talking about before that, way before that was a turn of phrase that people were using so frequently. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was interesting too, talking to Brett, you know, we met him while we were doing the adaptation and hung out a lot and just talked to him about his relationship to the, to the book. And he actually said that he really thought that he was writing a feminist book. So 
imagine his disappointment when it was not only was it not considered a feminist book, it pissed feminists off and became like this, you know, piece of piece of work that, you know, was held up as an example of, of bad misogynist art. Um, and that was interesting too. It's almost like we saw, I saw that in the book, um, what, he, what he was going for. And I mean, at some point it was just like, well, if there wasn't so much protracted, sexualized violence toward women, then people wouldn't get distracted by that. <laughs> Uh, but, but Mary and I also just really, we didn't want to look like, you know, lady filmmakers who, uh, you know, were afraid of the violence. Like we, you know, we knew we had to have some real violence, uh, um, but we just, you know, a fraction of, for people who haven't read the book, but have seen the film. I mean, that movie, it makes it, <laughs> the movie makes the book look like a Disney film. Wait, the other way around. The book makes the movie look like a Disney film. <laughs> Um, and what's interesting too is that we had controversy along the way because they offered the lead role to Leonardo DiCaprio and he was the like biggest movie star in the world at the time he was just coming off Titanic and and then um, Mary the Mary said she didn't want to direct the biggest movie star in the world in, in this movie and she, she's like oh you know there's gonna be a team of people telling what to do yeah. uh, and so Oliver Stone then came on board so imagine that movie yeah. It was directed by Oliver Stone and starring Leonardo DiCaprio. I just kind of, part of me wants that movie to exist because I'm just so curious what it, like what, how it, how, well, you just know it would be very different. It's Oliver Stone, like his style is, is like over the topness is what he does. Uh, so it would be, it would be, and you know, and Leo's a great actor, but the whole concept of not, of being interchangeable with so many people, like Christian was at a perfect point in his career to play that part because well, first of all, we didn't know it at the time, but he's a magical shapeshifter who can do anything. <laughs> um, but also, you know, he wasn't like a household name, a household face, at, whereas Leo was. So like making a movie in the wake of Titanic in which everyone's like, what, what guy? And it's like, that's Leonardo DiCaprio, the most famous actor in the world. So uh, it would have been, it just would have been an interesting exercise or there would have been a, a kind of suspension of disbelief uh, even more than the current, the actual movie requires. Yeah, but it, I guess it, it also, I don't know how, because I've, I've heard about the Leonardo DiCaprio being on before. There's, there's just something about the way you uh, and, and Mary made this movie that it just, it, it has this kind of like, it's almost like this is what women are afraid of. It's like good looking, powerful men and what they will do. Whereas the novel isn't as much like that. And maybe Leonardo DiCaprio could play this kind of insecure guy and Oliver Stone would have made it about the pressures of trying to build yourself as a man in this world. But it, I don't know, I think you've got something really unique that uh, I, I don't think I would have got it from the book how you did, just me reading. Mm. So I think that's, that's something that's kind of nice about a film adaption to have a kind of thing that stands on its own. And I think Christian Bale, is the only person who had the body for the movie you made. I don't think Leonardo DiCaprio. Could. And that's not, and he, he, Christian Bale being Christian Bale, uh, that is not what his body looked like when he auditioned. Yeah, yeah. He just, and that's not what his teeth looked like. Like yeah. he literally got his teeth like straightened and Americanized. You know, he, he like Tom Cruise and his own, and Christian's own agent were his, like sort of, you know, uh, who he was trying to emulate or, or copy. Uh, and, uh, and then he just went from, just having a nice young man's body to having this like ridiculous Adonis. <laughs> That's Mr. Bale that uh, we've all seen that that man is incredibly committed to his uh, roles. Yeah, and so obviously you were saying like Brett got, uh, he, he thought of it as a feminist novel. At least it was a kind of like an indictment of male behavior or the way that the culture was going then. And I guess looking at it now, cause rereading it today, I see it as almost uh, like a premonition of what was going to happen uh, since 2016. What happens when all of our senses are kind of squished and flattened together to where you could have a tab where you're shopping for a suit and then hardcore pornography right next to it on an equal playing field. It has this, the book feels like relevant today, but the movie has its own kind of response to it. Do you think that, did you have a positive, did people see it as a feminist movie when it came out or did you have a negative backlash just like Brett? Um, we had some terrible reviews um, and uh, calling it misogynist and exploitive. Um, it's a weird movie that way because it was, its popularity uh, 
was a very slow burn. And for the first five years of its life, it sort of felt like a movie that had flopped. Um, I think we owe part of its new success to, or newer, newish success to, to a literally a generation of people being born and growing up <laughs> because it's been 20 years yeah. uh, and, and to Christian Spain because people I think saw him in all the many amazing roles he's done and then just wanted to see what else can this guy do and they discovered American Psycho. But then also I think maybe that we weren't close enough to the 80s and, and the world hadn't metastasized into what it is now. Like it was just kind of in an in-between space culturally. Yeah. It's like, I always joke with Mary, I'm like, you know, it's hard to be so ahead of your time. Yeah. <laughs> That's our burden to bear. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But it, but it, there's also it also seems like the movie was so uh, memeable, which wouldn't have been possible back then. But right. now, like when I like I I'm from Canada, but I live in Iceland. When I mention American Psycho, it's it's everywhere. Like everyone knows the and from the movie when it came out here, this is something people don't always necessarily shed in a negative light either. So like his morning routine and the facial scrubs and the crunches and everything. A lot of bankers here, because Iceland famously has a problem with banking control, they kind of emulate it to this day where it's like, oh, I had my American psycho phase, like, you know, last year where I was working out and making my face perfect. And That's the weirdest thing about this movie to me is that, <laughs> that, that, that the very people that we're sending up, you know, commenting on, um, almost spoofing, uh, although it's more sophisticated than that, um, like many of those people adore this movie and don't understand that it's uh, an evisceration of their kind. I mean, I just, I have the number of men and it's, it, it, and I'm not exaggerating, it's a lot of men have said to me like, dude, you wrote that movie? Bro, I am Patrick Bateman. And I'm like, <laughs> are you a loser or a serial killer? Like what movie did you see? And then I'm like, no, this is awesome. It's, yeah. it's actually sending up people, the people it's sending up are some of its biggest fans. It's, it's operating at a lot of levels. Uh, as as any, any Brett Ellis um, uh, thing, anything that Brett Ellis touches will, will somehow operate on a meta level. Although he, you know, he, Brett has, um, he did, did he tweet it? Did he do it in an interview? He said, um, American Psycho never should have been made into a movie. Yeah, I, I, I can understand why he thinks that not because of not liking the movie but it's it's such a personal book like reading it now and after listening to him on his podcast like you know like these asides where he talks about uh genesis and whitney houston and huey lewis in the news this is what brett is still doing to this day like this is a really personal book for him so i can imagine mm -hmm. it's adapted and kind of it's a life of its own he's like uh you know uh that was actually kind of like how i really felt this is about me and my insecurities and i <laughs> And he couldn't really admit that, I don't think, for a while. So I, I could see that kind of response because it has become its own beast. Like uh, at the end of this uh, live stream, we have people from all around the world reading sections in different languages and all the 30 different languages this has been published in. Like this is a, and it got popular on top. It was one of those weird books like Fight Club that got kind of a boost from the movie as well. So the book became more popular because of the movie and they played off each other as different things. It's really fascinating. I, know, I mean, uh, but I do think that there are a lot of people who like the book, I like the movie who wouldn't uh, be able to stomach the book, yeah. you know, who wouldn't see the violence as, you know, ironic or not ironic, but, you know, making a point or the, the excess of the violence is, you know, is making its own point um, about just being excessive, you know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's that it's it, like it's that's the different kind of like even in the movie, the violence is kind of is not where there's any humor at all. Like the violence is when it delves into like horror in the movie, but in the book, he manages sometimes to make these recollections of horrible things be kind of darkly funny. Yeah, yeah, like how you guys do that. I don't know how it happened with this movie, but the die because I just rewatched it last night, and it's just uh, it's did you recognize me? Yes, I, did. <laughs> I, thought, I thought your role was the like the closest to the book. Yeah, I mean the, the dialogue, and I believe my dialogue is is directly from the book. I mean, yeah, yeah. the scene is much longer in the book, but but uh, those are all those words are. Um, but, uh, I mean, I mean, I did. I, I was dying to just be able to go. Where do you summer? To a, <laughs> 
Yeah, was, I was like, that's, that's genius. That's Brett. <laughs> yeah, it was, no, it's, yeah, it was really good. The movie, yeah, but the movie, the, the, even the musical references that you guys got in, he's addressing it to them. So it becomes kind of menacing. Like when he's like, you know, Huey Lewis in the news, then he, you know, cuts up Paul Allen or Paul Owen in the book. When he does that in the movie, it makes it like, so these kind of things are psychopathic and weird, but in the book, he's addressing the reader and it's almost like sad and lonely. So it's like- Yeah, it's, that yeah. was, we, I mean, we were really, we just loved uh, those, those passages, those music passages, and, but we were really stumped. How did we do this? We were pretty proud of ourselves. We're like, oh, when he starts talking about music, you're gonna start to realize this person is toast. <laughs> like, <laughs> if he gets done talking about Whitney Houston, he's gonna kill you. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and yeah, so it's different because it it's it 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 lost some of its loserishness loser because it got scary. Where yeah, you yeah. got scared for. Uh, I'm amazed. Uh, I'm amazed at. Uh, how many people actually let us use their music. Um, you will notice if you listen closely in the Whitney Houston monologue, uh, it, where I'm also laughing at him uh, for liking Whitney Houston. Sorry, Whitney. Um, uh, the, the, it's just a sound like an orchestral arrangement that sounds just enough like the greatest love of all that if you're talking about Whitney Houston and you're listening to that, you might think you're hearing it. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so we wouldn't, the Whitney Houston's estate didn't want us to, to, didn't want to use our music, so didn't want to let us use her music, surprise. Um, Huey Lewis, on the other hand, not only said fine, but have you seen that he did, Huey Lewis himself did a shot for shot remake of the scene where he talks about Huey Lewis and the news, but oh. Huey Lewis is talking about American Psycho, the movie, <laughs> and he, and the person sitting in the chair uh, that would be Jared Leto is Weird Al Yankovic, who oh, yeah. made a lot of fun of Huey Lewis. So he gets the kid. It's very meta and it's very well done. I highly recommend it. Okay, yeah, I'll definitely share it that. It begins with, do you like American Psycho? And he's like in the raincoat. And I'm just like, <laughs> you know what, Huey? I, I respect you that you realize that like you were a punchline in this movie, but you're you're, you're like embracing it. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's it, that, yeah, the, the, where you guys got comedy, it's just, it's so funny how it's different than the book and you were able to get this. How was it, how was it like writing for, like, did you imagine a different person playing Bateman when you were writing it? Like, what did you have in your head for Bateman when you thought of this? Or did you already have Leonardo DiCaprio or someone in mind? Gosh, that's an interesting question that I don't, it, amazingly, I don't think anyone's ever asked me, which okay. is, you know, because a lot of people have asked a lot of questions about this movie over the years. I mean, I think that I I just had like a like a Max Headroom in my head, you know. Max Headroom was like the, I don't know, was he in a music video? What 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 did Max Headroom do? He was just like an ultimate '80s iconic, uh, like ro digital robot man. I don't even know yeah. what he was. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I just and I also pictured um, the video of Peter Gabriel's Big Time. Okay which is also iconic 80s, you know, to really poking at the same message. So there was a lot of imagery uh, from the 80s, but there's, there was no face. I mean, maybe, maybe because I was starting to know Brett and hang out with him, there might've been a little Brett in Patrick, mm -hmm. it, uh, you know, cause Brett's tall and handsome and, you know, dresses well. Yeah. Uh, but, but, you know, like even in general, when I'm uh, writing, a, you know, the, there's, this, a, there's a shape shifter. It's, it's a dream, it feels like a, you know, a character you're dreaming, you're like where it was, like it was my mom, but it wasn't my mom. And then it turned into like my dog and whatever. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Oh yeah. And then when you were, and then I guess, how, how did you select the parts that you did to make like you, like obviously you and Mary made the movie that you made. Well, how did you know which parts you thought were the most important to get it along? We just read it to each other and uh, the book and, and kind of, you know, uh, said like, well, we want, we love this scene. We love this scene. And then we eventually just had, you know, just identified all the scenes that we wanted and then, and then talked about how to make them some sort of traditional narrative. Um, and really that was a lot about just taking out a lot of the violence, but then uh, I, or w one of us, we decided that it, sort of in deference to the book and to all the violence that we weren't showing that the big speech that he makes, um, the confession in, you know, to, on his lawyer's answering machine would actually, what he's actually cataloging are all 
violence murders that he did in the book that he we don't see in the movie but that's that was sort of a nod to like you know he does kill like an old gay man and his dog and you know I, and he does like you know cook brains and i just wanted to just be like we hear you brett yeah here's some of the horrible things this guy did and like uh i i recently just watched again the the tv series that mary heron was involved with I'm not, I'm not sure if you were, uh, Alias Grace? Alias Grace, yeah. Yeah, she directed all of it. Yeah, she directed all of it. And so, like, with you guys doing movies now and, and producing stuff in today's climate, do you think you would have been, if you came with this as an idea rather than being asked to do it, would you be able to get a movie like American Cycle made today in, in the film industry as it is? That's interesting. I think possibly more so. Um, because, you know, people are listening to women and women directors more and because people have quotas to fill, I'm not being idealistic, you know what I mean? People just, you know, they have to have, you have to have a certain number of women doing stuff, uh, you know, you have to have a certain number of people who aren't uh, white men. Um, so, or would it be too, everybody would be too uh, scared to make something, well, have you seen Promising Young Woman? Yeah, I did. Uh, so that got made and that's you know arguably having the same conversation from a different angle uh yeah it is definitely it's a it's a yes a very very uh different than i thought it would be as a revenge movie yeah i deliberately ignore i deliberately didn't pay attention once i knew what it was to, uh, to any i didn't want to know but yeah it was it's a it's a really interesting movie it's you know i just saw it like three days ago and i'm still talking about it yeah so but so, so if that movie can get made, but that's a female protagonist. Mm -hmm. And like the guys in that movie are not Christian Bale. Like this, the one, the thing about American Psycho is that Christian Bale is so attractive that women would still kind of be attracted to him when he's doing this awful stuff. And men still want to be him, even though he's obviously a loser and a serial killer. Right. <laughs> Whereas like the guys in Promising Young Woman are very like, they're nice and things like that. But this is not, the, it's not the same it's not the same sort of image of a movie. Yeah, but, yeah. but it also imagines a hyper real kind of world uh, in a way, you know, to, to, to get a point across, you know, like, like you know, it, we're not, we're, it's hard to believe in real life that a woman would f go out every single weekend and get fake drunk uh, and then put herself through that. Do you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. to, because it's, that, that you still have to go through a lot and have that person touching you and do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Although it is fucking amazing. Anyway, um, I just want to warn you that I actually have to go in five minutes. Okay. okay uh, Sorry that it's so short. No, no, that's that's fine. I think we were, get, we were getting off into other movies. So it was just- I know, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so we were, I'm a digressor by nature. Oh yeah, me too. This, no, this was uh, perfect, just, I guess. Um, for anyone who like, I, I, I don't know, what, would we, what was a good question to end on? I well, think. I think one of the questions that you mentioned in, uh, earlier in an email, I think was what, uh, if I could do, could have done something differently. Yeah, yeah. That's, 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 differently. If you could, if you could change now looking at, cause you did recently watch it again, how would you, what, what changes would you make, you know, if you could go back and edit your younger self doing this? I mean, I don't know the answer to the solution to the problem, but I would figure out a way to make it very, very clear that it's not all in his head. Yeah. And Mary and I have talked endlessly about it. Like we thought we did that, but we didn't. So what what could we have done differently? Um, so that, I would, I would fix that problem. But I don't know, it's like, it maybe is a, if you pull up that thread, the whole thing unravels. You know, if you try to like really like, you know, give, I mean, when he goes to the apartment that he killed Paul Allen in, and it's the, it's just all clean, and the and um, and the the real estate lady asks him to leave. Yeah, yeah, it's it's obvious. I mean, the way I interpreted it, and the way we meant it, was like she doesn't care who died; she wants to sell this place. So, like, the blood's been cleaned up. She doesn't care if he's the murderer. Just get out. Like, I I see that you're related to this, and I, I don't want any of that because all I care about is selling this apartment, not right. maybe solving a bunch of murders. Um, but people interpreted that as it was all in his head. Um, yeah, I don't know because the because the book it is all in his head. I think because it's so hammered over at the end. Are you interviewing Brett for this? Uh, or have you interviewed him for this? No, I'm, I'm doing that at the end of all of these. Oh, I see. Yeah, but so then, we ask him if he thinks that the, that the book was, it was really supposed to all be in his head because I've actually have never asked him that question. I just assumed that he wanted it to be ambiguous because- Yeah, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's 
there's no resolution, but like everything for the last basically a hundred pages is reminding you that the book started with a chapter called April Fools and that everything. Right. And no one he really knows he's really harmed. Everyone who's gotten killed, except for one character who it looks like he actually is in London. So it is kind of, yeah, it is. I, I was expecting it to be more ambiguous because that's how I remembered it from reading it 10 years ago. And then I just reread section by section and was tweeting it. And I was like, oh. That's funny because, you know, I haven't read it in a long time. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, my memory of it may be totally muddled by the experience of seeing the movie a thousand million times. Yeah, exactly. That's what, that's what <laughs> happened to me. I thought it was, I thought it was going to be more ambiguous than the movie, which I thought was obvious he did do it. That's what I thought was going to happen. But now I've got two different, two different endings, two different, uh, two different, whole di two different stories, actually, in a lot of ways. I keep meaning to reread the book because I want to know what we made up and I don't know anymore. <laughs> oh, uh, you know what I mean? Like there, there is some dialogue that is, that is not just directly pulled from the book and I don't know the answer. I, mean, I really should, because I talk about this movie a lot and it looks like I'm going to be talking about this movie yeah. a lot yeah, in, yeah. In, in, in future years. Um, yeah, so, and then, you know, there's a, there's a moment, it's when the character of Christy is running, it's after my character get kill, gets killed and she's running through the apartment and, you know, she, there's dead bodies in the closet and then she's, uh, she's the, the camera just goes across the wall that says, die, yu die yuppie scum. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I remember walking onto the set that day and being like, Mary, have you seen this? Like, do you, is this what you want? And Mary's like, yeah, no, that's what I asked for. And I was like, would Patrick Bateman write die yuppie scum? It yeah. didn't make any sense to me and it still doesn't. And I don't think that's in the book. I think that was a production designer's idea, our Gideon Ponte, lovely man, uh, uh, of what to put. And, it, and Mary, I think that she was obviously in the middle of directing and she was like, no, no, it's good, it's fine. Like, get out of my face. I got stuff to do and I still am like it doesn't make sense because only Patrick Bateman would have written it yeah and Patrick Bateman wouldn't write that he doesn't secretly hate himself I mean not about I mean he does secretly hate himself I guess but not because he's a yuppie <laughs> you know right, I mean? exactly he like even near the end he's like you know as bad as my life is at least I'm rich yeah yeah and but that, that's what the taxi driver says to him at the end of the novel to like, die yuppie scum yeah because he mugs up like he's in a taxi and the taxi drives oh, him right. up and mugs him and he's like, what? And like, and he doesn't do anything back, which is another hint that he's not this serial killer, this violent psychopath, because every time he's really confronted, he never really responds in the way that he seems to in his imagination, where he's just- like, Right. Yeah. All right, I, York, I, you've convinced me, I'm going to read the book again. Yes, that's the point <laughs> of the book club. <laughs> all right, all right, I'm sorry that I have to leave you, but I do. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you very much for this. This is, uh, yeah, it's been a it's an honor and a privilege and I hope you enjoyed yourself. I did. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Bye for now. Bye-bye. This has been the Bretty Stanalis Podcast Book Club live stream, American Psycho. We're uh, at the Secret Cellar, Iceland's first and only stand-up comedy club. Uh, a thank you to Miami Club. It's a bar here in, in Iceland where we filmed the intro. Also, a thank you to Brecky, uh, the person who filmed and edited the the intro we did. Uh, Cormico Scalder is the uh, clothing store that supplied the suit. Yeah, so thank you to them as well. I, I want to leave you, um, I leave you everyone uh, with uh, a little thing here. Uh, from a blurb inside of American Psycho, it says, he has forced us to look at the intolerable material, and so few novelists try for that anymore. And that was Norman Mailer in Vanity Fair. And Norman Mailer uh, wrote a book, a Manhattan novel about murder, about a guy who gets into the crazy underbelly. It's not, as, it's not as surreal in any way. And Joan Didion had said about this novel, perhaps the only serious New York novel since The Great Gatsby, and I, I would say that Amer after rereading re American Psycho, and you know, obviously as the host of this, I might be forced to say it, but I, I'm not. I would say this is the great American novel of the last 30 years, uh, if not the New York, and it is the Great Gatsby of our time in a way, because this is the Great Gatsby if both Nick and Jay were the same person, and it was told in in that manner. But at the end, it doesn't really matter what uh, your opinion or criticism or uh, I guess the mass or public opinion of this novel has been because a novel 
is essentially a, a relationship with the author, just one on one between you, you the reader, and, and the author. And that's something that obviously this book has affected people around the world. Um, you know, millions of people. I'm not sure what the number is of reading, but we know the novel has been translated into 25. Uh, over 25 languages, and actually, this iconic line from the book, this sentence, which I think everyone knows, this has been translated into 25, or, yeah, like I said, more than 25 languages around the world, and so obviously it has affected a lot of people. There is an idea of Patrick Bateman, some kind of abstraction, but there is no real me, only an entity, something illusory. And though I can hide my cold gaze and you can shake my hand and feel flesh gripping yours, and maybe you can even sense our lifestyles are probably comparable, I simply am not there. Thank you guys very much. I hope you enjoyed. And here's the way that American Psycho has affected people around the world. Bateman. Einen abstrakten Entwurf. Oder kein wahres Ich, nur eine Erscheinung. Etwas Schemenhaftes. Und obwohl ich in der Lage bin, mein kaltes Starren zu verbergen und du mir die Hand schütteln kannst und dabei Fleisch spürst, das Fleisch umschließt und vielleicht sogar das Gefühl hast, unser Lebensstil sei vergleichbar. Ich bin einfach nicht da. Hay como una idea de Patrick Bateman, una especie de abstracción, pero no hay un yo auténtico, solo una entidad, algo ilusorio. Y aunque yo pueda disimular mi fría mirada y tú puedas estrecharme la mano y notar que su carne aprieta la tuya, y pueda hasta que puedas considerar que nuestros estilos de vida son parecidos. Существует представление о Патрик Бейдмен. Некая абстракция, но нет меня настоящего, только какая-то иллюзарная сущность. И хотят, я могу скрыть мой холодный взор, и мою руку можно пожать, и даже ощущать схватку моей плоти, можно даже почувствовать, что ваш образ жизни Возможно, сопоставим с моим. Меня просто нет. C'è un'idea di Patrick Bateman, una sorta di astrazione, ma non esiste un vero e proprio me. C'è soltanto qualcosa di illusorio al mio posto, un'entità che è possibile toccare con mano, se non che io non ci sono. Puoi pure sentire la mia carne a contatto con la tua e credere che i nostri stili di vita siano comparabili, ma io semplicemente non ci sono. Er is wel zoiets als Patrick Batman, een soort illusie. Maar er is geen echt ik, alleen entiteit, een denkbeeld, iets. En hoewel ik mijn kille blik kan verbergen en mijn vlees voelt wanneer je mijn handen schudt. En misschien zelfs kunt voelen dat onze levensstijlen vergelijkbaar zijn, ben ik er simpelweg niet. Il existe une idée de Patrick Batman. Une espèce d'abstraction. Mais il n'existe pas de moi réel. Juste une entité. Une chose illusoire. Et bien que je puisse dissimuler mon regard glacé, mon regard fixe, bien que vous puissiez me serrer la main et sentir une chair qui se étreint la vôtre, et peut-être même considérer que nous avons des styles de vie comparables, je ne suis tout simplement pas là. Există o idee numită Patrick Batman, un fel de abstracțiune, dar nu și un eu real, ci doar o entitate, ceva iluzoriu și cu toate ce îmi pot ascunde privirile înghețate și pot da mâna cu cineva și acel cineva simte niște mușchi care strâng mușchii lui și chiar rămâne cu impresia că stilurile noastre de viață sunt poate comparabile. Eu Pur și simplu, nu există. On olemassa idea Patrick Batemanista. 
jonkinlainen hahmotelma, mutta se ei pysty kuvastamaan todellista minääni. Se on kuviteltu kokonaisuus. Ja vaikka pystyn kätkemään kylmän katseeni ja vastaamaan käden puristukseesi, ja ehkä pystyt aistimaan elämäntapojemme samankaltaisuuden, en yksinkertaisesti ole siellä. Yra Patriko beit mano ideja, kažkokia abstrakcija, bet iš tikrųjų manęs nėra, tik esatis, kažkokia iluzija. Ir nors galiu nusilėpti šaltą žvilgsnį, galite spausti man ranką ir justi, kaip jos nesatvirti spaudžia ranką jums. Gal net galite palyginti mūsų gyvenimo būdą. Manęs tiesiog nėra. Jei ideja Patrika beit mano, pamna abstrakcija, al spražinio ho mane nema. Лише ця сутність, інколи ілюзорна, і хоча я можу сховати холод свого погляду, і ви можете потиснути мені руку, відчуваючи плоть навколо моєї плоті, і, можливо, навіть думаєте, що наші життя схожі. Мене тут просто нема. Постої ідея у Патріку Бейтмену. Ко нека абстракція, але й нема права в мене. Već je tu samo jedinka, nešto nestvarno. Ima da ja mogu da prikrijem svoj ledeni pogled i ti možeš da mi stisneš ruku i da osjetiš kako je neko meso steže. Možda čak i naslutiš da nam je stil života verovatno sličan. Mene jednostavno nema. Te finns en forestelling om Patrick Bateman. En slags abstraktion. Men det finns inget verkligt jag. Bara en varelse. Någonting inbillat. Och trots att jag kan gömma min kalla blick och du kan skaka min hand och känna att det är kött som greppar ditt. Och kanske till och med känna att våra sätt att leva förmodligen är jämförbara. Så är jag helt enkelt inte där. Ima predstava za Patrick Bateman. Някаква абстракция, но няма истинско аз, а само същество. Нещо иллюзорно и макар да мога да скрия студения си поглед и вие да стиснете ръката ми и да почувствате как плът обхваща вашата. И може би, дори може да усетите, че начинът ни на живот вероятно е сравним. Аз просто не съм там. Е също ти го як идея Патрика Бейтмана, също в родзай у абстракции która nie jest mną, a jedynie bytem w dodatku iluzorycznym. I chociaż wcale nie muszę patrzeć lodowatym wzrokiem i można potrząsnąć mą dłonią, czując prawdziwe ciało i chociaż komuś może wydawać się, że nasze, moje i jego żywoty są porównywalne, to mnie po prostu nie ma. Pastał Patryka Bejdman ideja. Kaut kāda abstrakcija, taču nekāda reāla mani snau. Tikai vienība kaut kas iluzors. Un kaut kā es varētu noslēpt savu ledēno skatieni. Un tu vari man paspiest roku un sajust, kā tavam tvērienam atbild dzīva miesa. Un varbūt pat koncertēt, ka mums ir līdzīgs dzīvesveids. Manis vienkārši te nav. Tā ir forestilling am Petru Bateman, in slags abstraktion. Men tā ir ne vietli jāja, ko ne vēram nedeļu sojas. Og selvom jeg kan skjule mit kolde blik, og du kan trykke min hånd og mærke, at kød griber om dit, og måske kan du endda føle vores livsstil sandsynligvis en sammenlig. Jeg er der simpelthen ikke. Det er Christian. Postoj i predodžba o Patriku Batmanu. Nekakva abstrakcija, ali ne postojem stvarni ja. Samo neka tlapnja i prem da mogu prikriti svoj hladni pogled, i ti se možeš rukovati sa mnom i osjetiti kožu kako dodiruje tvoju i možda čak osjetiti da su naši životi usporedivi. Mene jednostavno nema. Tako je predstava Patrika Batemana. Jaká se je abstrakce, ale to není moje skutečné já. Jenom jaká se je abstraktní bytost, co si iluzorního. A ačkoliv dovedu skrývat chlad ve svých očích a ty si se mnou můžeš potřást rukou a ucítit její sevření a možná si i myslet, že máme podobný životní styl. Já to prostě nejsem. 
Hi ha com una idea de Martin Bateman, una espècie d'abstracció, però no hi ha un jo autèntic, només una entitat, quelcom il·lusori. I encara que jo pugui dissimular la meva freda mirada i tu puguis encaixar-me la mà i notar que la seva carn m'estén la teva, i pot ser que fins i tot puguis considerar que els nostres estils de vida són semblants, senzillament, jo no sóc aquí. Van egy elképzelés Patrick Batemanről, valami felé abstrakció, de nincs igazi én, csak egy entitás, valami illuzorikus, és bár el tudom rejteni hideg tekintetemet, és megrászhatod a kezem, és meg tudod érezni, hogy a test megfogja a tiédet, és talán még azt is megérezheted, hogy élet stílusunk valószínűleg összehasonlítható. Én nem vagyok ott. Finns det en idé om Patrick Bateman? En slags abstraktion? Men det er ikke riktig jeg. Bare en enhet. Noe illusorisk. Og selv om jeg kan skjule mitt kalde blikk, og du kan ta meg i hånden og føle kjøtt som griper ditt kjøtt. Kanskje også at du er likevel ikke. Jeg er ikke her. Gwanyu Pate Lika Beite Man Chun Zai Jirge Guo Xiang Mo Zhong Chou Xiang Gai Nian Dan Zhen Shi De Wo Bing Bu Sun Zai 存在的仅仅是一具尸体，让人产生错觉。虽然我能藏起冰冷的目光，并且在我们握手时，你能感受到剑我的手。或许你甚至可以感觉到我们的生活方式大同小异，但我并不存在那里。Patrick Bateman er bara hugmynd, einhvers konar draumsýn, vitund án raunverulegrar tilvistar, eins og sjónkverfing, og þótt ég geti falið kuldalegt augnlit mitt, og þú geti tekið í höndin á mér og fundið hold við hold, og jafnvel fundist við eiga eitt og annað sameinlegt, þá er ég einfaldlega ekki hér. When I think about it, makes me think I'm bad. Wonder about it, and I don't know why. Won't you tell me, baby? I'm pouring up, I got my shoes untied, and I'm thinking about you every single night. It's not enough for me to just stay by, just thinking about you, baby. I'm pouring it, I got my shoes untied, and I hold the answer to your question, why? Tell me you left me and I won't lie Just thinking about you, baby Sophisticated from my head to toe Tell me something that you just don't know Oh I get warm as I pass by You look at me, baby, like my shoes on top And it's starting to drive me crazy Shoes untied, and I'm thinking about you every single night. It's not enough for me to just stay back. 